to take. Hello, everyone. Good evening, and, and thank you for joining us this, this evening. Call the meeting to order and ask at this time for public comment about matters which are on our closed session agenda. Grace, um, my Zoom does not allow me at this point to see who might be on. Do you have anyone who wishes to make a public comment at this point? I do not see anybody. Okay, then we will adjourn into closed session and see you back at seven o'clock. Set. Great, thank you very much, Grace. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's meeting. A um, couple things for you. Um, first of all, I need to report out what happened in closed session. We have two new hires we are pleased to announce. The first is Fuzalipa Robles uh, is coming on board as a science aide at Foothill Elementary, effective November 22nd. And Jason Rode coming on board as a computer technology specialist, effective December 9th. Welcome both of them to the district and we look forward to having you with us. All uh, right, that was all that we actually um, concluded in closed session. Just a quick um, comment here um, tonight. We have um, Phyllis, Melissa, uh, Scott, and myself. Eric is unable to be with us tonight and sends his uh, regrets. Uh, okay, uh, moving out from that, our first item is to approve the agenda for this night's meeting. And I'm going to go ahead and pull item 8.7, which is, if I can flip through my pages fast enough here was intended to be a confirmation of the SUSD Board of Trustees Clerk as County Committee Board Representative. I'm gonna pull that item because I'm doing a little research and jogging our memories a bit. Um, Grace and I managed to figure out that we made a decision, we just can't remember exactly how long ago, that that would be a permanent uh, responsibility of our clerk. So there's no reason for us to take any action tonight. So with that um, uh, little change in place, May I have a motion to approve our agenda for this evening? I move that we approve our agenda this evening with um, moving item B. Thank you. May I have a second? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All right. Uh, this time we will move into the organizational portion of this meeting. Organizational meeting. Um, and I'll turn things over to Ken. Around. Hi. Good evening. As you know, uh, Every December, all school boards uh, vote for uh, their officers, the clerk, in our case, we have a clerk and a president. And in our district, we do it by self-nomination. You can nominate your peer. So um, I will uh, facilitate the election of both the president first, and then we'll do the clerk second. And then, um, however that lands, that person will run the rest of the meeting. So may I have um, nominations for the office of president for the next 12 months? I would like to nominate myself for that job. Any other nominations? Cynthia is nominated for president and, oh, do we need a second? Do we need, I don't think we do a second. So no. that's, a, you just do one by one. So with Cynthia being nominated, do we have, uh, have all in favor of Cynthia for president say aye? Aye. Okay. So for clerk, um, that's the their position and everybody nominated themselves for the position of clerk or nominated another, another person. I would like to nominate myself. Okay, Melissa for clerk. Any other nominations? Not hearing any. All in favor of Ms. Stannis for clerk? Aye. Aye. All right, and we're off to the race. Thank we you. Are indeed, that was okay. Moving along, um, I will let also let uh, members of our audience know that it's cold in here. Some of us are warming up, some of us are not. So that's why you see the jackets, and um, they might move a little faster just to get. Okay, moving on to our action consent items. Does anyone have anything here they would like to um, comment on or pull? No? All right, then may I have a motion with regards to the action consent items? Um, I'm wishing you for the action consent items. Thank you, Scott. Second? I will second. Thank you. All in favor? All right, good. Moving along here. On to communication. Uh, first of all, we'll go with comments from the community. Uh, this time, we give the public an opportunity to make comments of, of, or announcements appropriate to our educational programs and activities that are not otherwise already on our agenda. Uh, we use Zoom and the raise, hand, raise your hand feature to do this. Go ahead now, please, and hit raise your hand if you're going to want to make a comment during this time. And in a moment, we'll have Grace actually uh, recognize people uh, in some order that she figures out. Um, we ask that you keep your comments to a maximum of two minutes to speak. And um, 
While it's not required, we would appreciate it if you would tell us your name and your affiliation with our district um, when you address us, and um, we will get underway. Grace, do we have anyone wishing to make a comment at this time? Yes, uh, Alicia. Good evening, board members. Um, I don't know if it's on the agenda specifically, but I would like to offer some feedback in regards to the um, safety monitoring before any school event. We had the wonderful opportunity to see our kids showcase their orchestra performance, for example. The one, and I volunteered the safety check. I was one of several parents to volunteer and I offered, I wrote an email today, I didn't expect any answer today, of offering some input to the people who are in charge of defining guidelines, because I feel like if when we hold Moana, we need to revisit the guidelines, the volume of people who will attend, it won't be feasible to do the things you're asking us to do if we don't streamline it in some other way. So I am happy to put heads together and work around some issues to make sure we can have a successful, healthy event without this added stress for the parents who are volunteering and do not need to have any confrontation from anybody. Um, I don't know if it's clear what I'm trying to say, but we can make things better and avoid some situations if we just think a few steps ahead. Thank you. Alicia. Okay, uh, can we have next, um, Grace? Uh, Steve Stroot. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, hold on just one second, Steve. Oh, there we go, we've got the timer straight. Go ahead. Before my time, um, I just wanna remind the board of board bylaw 9323-6B, uh, the board shall not prohibit public criticism of its policies, procedures, programs, services, acts, or omissions. And 6C, the board shall not prohibit public criticism of district employees. However, when a, whenever a member of the public initiates specific complaints or charges against an individual employee, the board president shall inform the complainant of the appropriate complaint procedure. So on April 19th, I gave you evidence of discrimination, defamation, harassment, negligence, possible in, intentional infliction of emotional distress and more by administrative employees. On October 29th, I informed you of a conflict of interest possible harassment and possible retaliation by another administrative employee. Board policy AR4031 says that when discrimination or harassment are reported, the superintendent or their designee have 30 days to complete an investigation and give all parties the results, whether a complaint was filed or not. My questions are, were these investigations carried out? Why haven't I received the results? When should I expect them? Have any employees or board members breached their duties? Are administrative staff held at the same standards as classified and certificated? Does it make sense for a person with a conflict of interest to conduct these investigations? If a member of the public feels the board has acted improperly, who do they report it to? Will you include these investigations or their absence in evaluations of employees or yourself? Your contract with the superintendent says that you will indemnify them in almost any scenario, whether they are at fault or not. Can the board impartially consider a superintendent's actions if they're expected to indemnify them? At what point would a superintendent's actions cause you to cease indemnifying them? Your emails to me have repeatedly referred to my notification of improprieties as a grievance only. Does board policy AR4031 state that charges of discrimination or harassment cannot be investigated if brought to you as a grievance? What about the part that says an investigation must take place whether or not a complaint has been filed? Great, thank you, Steve. Um, uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, just to note that you must pursue this according to the district's complaint process. And I'll leave that with you. Do we have anyone else, Grace? Nobody else. Great, thank you very much. 
Um, moving on now to comments from our employee groups. Do we have anyone, uh, Grace? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to comments from the superintendent. Hi, good evening. Uh, we have quite a, a quite a few slides for the updates. I'll save most of my remarks. I do want to um, announce to the community as we approach uh, the holidays, uh, we will close the district office after for, last, next Friday. Uh, we have a lot of folks that need to use some vacation, so we'll be closed for those two weeks. If there are issues, they can email the appropriate party and we'll, we'll respond to them. And just a reminder, we do have a planned uh, uh, network updates and we moved it to 11 o'clock tonight. So we do have a hard stop at 11. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, and some, some issues that need to be addressed uh, before, before next week. So there's some updates that must be made. Okay, thank you. Comments from board members? Um, I'll go ahead. Okay. So, um, so the, the first thing I wanted to mention is that our whole, our whole board attended CSBA down in San Diego uh, last week. Um, and there was lots, but this is my first time attending that in person last year we were virtual. Um, the biggest thing I noticed when talking to other school board members was how thankful I am for this community here. Um, the fact that everyone embraces, you know, in by and large vaccines, there's no questions about masks. Um, we have fairly reasonable parents and teachers. I heard lots of horror stories from other districts that are fighting those basic things and trying to get kids to wear masks every day. And I, I'm, I'm just so thankful that everyone here who just supports all the things we're doing to try to stop that to have a normal um, school experience, but still be safe. Um, and um, yeah, and then I think the, the um, whole conference was was very educational. Um, it was a little strange being down in San Diego. We all were wearing masks all the time, but not everyone was down there. And so it, it, it again made my um, appeal for this area even stronger. So and thanks to the district for helping us go through this. It was really a, a helpful thing to me. Okay. Uh, I know I say this every meeting and I'm going to say it again. I do want to continue to express my gratitude to our teachers, our students, our staff, and our families for continuing to be vigilant. I know we're all tired of it, um, but you know, we're all watching the news, we're seeing numbers starting to climb. And um, as Scott said, I'm very grateful to be in this community with people who really take everything very seriously. Um, so thank you. Again, every one of all of the efforts um, spent trying to keep us all safe and keep our schools open. Um, back in November, which seems like weeks and weeks ago, on uh, November 23rd, I did a site visit at Footnote. Um, it was the day before Thanksgiving recess, and in my mind, before I showed up, I was expecting the kids to be bouncing off the walls, but they were actually really calm, very focused, doing small group work and, and other work. Uh, visited several different grade levels. Uh, kids were busy working. Everything just seemed so normal, minus the masks. It just felt normal, which was great. Um, lots of kids saying hello to Mr. White as we went in and out of groups, uh, which was great to see. Uh, and we did discuss in the, the NPR for the lunchtime, they're starting to have options for kids to sit indoors and outdoors. Parents can request if they prefer an outdoor seating arrangement. Um, and we, we also had a chance to visit the Bakerspace group, and Mr. White expressed that he's looking for that uh, space getting to be utilized for it uh, as we move further into the school year. Um, like Scott said, we were all down at CSBA last week. Uh, it was very educational on many different levels. Uh, I think one thing that I wrote down that stuck out to me was somebody said, we are educating students for jobs that it don't exist. Yet. And that really, that really came out to me because, uh, you know, when I was growing up, we, we think we thought jobs are already there and you're going to have one of those jobs. Now everything's moving so quickly that we are. The kids today are going to be in jobs that we can't even see yet. Um, and that just, I thought it was an interesting way to frame the work that we're doing. Um, so, attended a variety of workshops having to do with leadership, communication strategies impacts on schools and students and the legal issues facing school boards right now. 
if I could just interject, you mentioned something about the parents opting for outdoor eating, and I think it was a third, and I think there was 100 students that were outside in Foothill, Brian said. So there's, you know, a significant amount of choosing, you know, to eat outside. I know it's getting cold, but the parents have decided that's, they feel more comfortable doing that versus the inside. So that was just interesting proportion. Those? Yes, I will be the next one. So, yes, I so I have a few items to recall and also some takeaway from the CSBS conference. And uh, yes, okay, my comments are a little bit longer, so please bear with me. Yeah, a lot of uh, thoughts going on there. So I went to the instructional run at Saratoga Elementary School with Cynthia and Kent on December 7th, and thanks to the person taking us to visit the case music program in the first and second grade, reading and writing class, and also the some fourth grade class, right? Yes, and it's, uh, it's always my pleasure to visit our school site and meet our students, the teacher in person. So actually, I'm very touched and very thankful to see that our students who are, who are ready, ready and also, also eager to learn and wearing the mask almost all day, at school, definitely not a fun experience, but when we see them at school, they always smile and show you that how happy they are to come to school. So I was very touched by this. And also, I'm glad to see that our site principal are forward thinkers and have a good ob uh, observations on the students and the campus culture. So one example that at Saratoga Elementary School, they New, they have a, a new calm room. It's a social emotion well-being room, I guess. Yes. So the students, so their plan is to incorporate two to three times emotional well-being time slot into students' schedule for the needed students daily. And this is a great prevention for students. Um, you know, like a, before the students melt down and they do the prevention to help them in order not to go that direction. So I think that's a great action. And also we visit the some classroom, the teachers just widely adopt a new method to address some issues that our students have due to the learning lag. And so one classroom, I saw that the teacher adopted the handwriting curriculum to enhance the first graders handwriting and the fine motor skills. Once she found out that those first grader or kindergarten last year didn't get enough handwriting training because of the virtual learning. And I really appreciate that our teachers spot this and uh, you know, use the curriculum on the first grader. And also the other room, the teachers um, use the, uh, sorry, yes, use the, uh, Sorry. Give every student a card with a barcode line and allow students to log into the TWIP system and immediately can direct the student to the math or English work they were doing previously. And so students can work independently with the teacher while the teacher helps other students. And I think that's a great way to train our students to be independent. And okay, and I also attended the SBF board meeting yesterday and uh, uh, I think, uh, yes, Mrs. Kelly Boots, our tech innovation specialist was invited to talk about the makerspace. And uh, so she talked about like what makerspace is, even we all heard about it, but might not be clear what it is. So her presentation just give us a big and a better picture of what it is. Yes, and uh, so that's great. And so I want to thank the um, SES who found this wonderful program, the Makerspace. And uh, so I want to encourage our parents and the community member to please either volunteer or donate to SES because SES is a great organization that, you know, support SUSD and our students um, wholeheartedly. And uh, okay, the last thing, okay. So I, I attended the CSBA conference last week. And uh, so, yeah, I have learned a lot. And uh, to my surprise, there are new technology and the science that can help, the, um, help us to better support our students. So I will just give one of the examples. So one of the session I went to was the 
whole health for, uh, for students and the staff. And uh, so in that section, I was surprised to learn that how advanced the technology and the science is now to monitor the well-being of human beings. A new design tool can do daily well-being checking. So by looking at the figures and the chart, this tool can analyze the trends of students' well-being and give appropriate aid and uh, advisable support individually. And the most powerful part is that an advisable support and the tool will be sent to you even before you realize that you are experiencing mental stress or crisis. And so I think that is very powerful. So I will definitely share this information with you and Flora later. Yes, and uh, okay. I think that's all from me. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so CSPA, uh, I always find something worthwhile out of the conference. Uh, learn a lot, a uh, couple points this year, uh, echo what, what Scott had to say, but add, I think 90 plus percent of the, the school districts just had a really hard last 18 months. Uh, uh, many have been very divided, as, have, as, as at times has our district. Uh, it's been very hard on school board members. I heard a lot of them talking about, not sure I can do this anymore, which was, was sad because what you usually hear is, yeah, this takes a lot of my time, but it's so worth it for the kids. It, it really bothered me that the, the tone uh, of the conversations had shifted there. Um, I have a lot of talk about the fun enrollment. Most of the districts are having that, uh, and whether you're basic aid or not basic aid, that affects you financially quite a bit. Thanks to the extra financial and state money, most of them are, most are not having a big financial problem this year. We'll take San Francisco out of that, that comment. Um, but they see handwriting on the wall big time um, as, as, the, as, as extra funds are, are out, and uh, then the defining enrollment and a lot, a lot of them are looking at closing schools. I did go to one of the uh, panel sessions on uh, closing of schools, and it was standing room only. The you know, fire marshal system where people allowed in. There are that many uh, districts that are, are worried about that. I love going to Saratoga Elementary with you, Phyllis, and, and Ken. Um, it was lovely to get to spend a little bit of time with Kristen Murphy. She's the principal that I think we all know the least because she's newest. Um, it's got a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, I feel very confident that the, the kids there are, are in good hands. Um, she is, we talked about handwriting. I think that was a great example of catching where children lagged a bit as a result of COVID and what are we going to do about it? Well, we spend more time on handwriting without tears. Um, she noted, as I think we have noted a number of times, I think Morris mentioned it, some others, behaviors that are below grade level in all kinds of social, emotional, developmental ways, less so than academic ways, and uh, how teachers are having to spend time on that. And I love seeing actually what it mean, what a data talk really means. Um, I know, Maura, you've talked about it before, but to visually see a board where they've taken a little paper for each child and on there for one, one slip for math and you capture their eye ready and their SBAC score, whatever else we have, and another slip for their English language arts reading level, whatever. And then they put these slips all over the board, categorized basically by uh, the kids who are uh, accelerated above where you would expect them to be at this point, kids who are where they need to be, kids who need a little help, kids who need a lot of help, and then you can see how they come and where we need to put more resource in. And it was visually very powerful for me to actually see that board because for some reason, every time you talked about it before, it was, it was slightly vague. And you know, I know exactly what we're doing and how powerful that can be for kids. Take a picture to illustrate that. Oh, okay. Good. Very good. Yes, it is really remarkable. It's, it was. Yes. Okay. That was all that I have to say. So then we'll move on. Uh, Ken, for updates. Thank you. Me. So we'll start. We've got quite a few pictures I want to point out from some of the. Uh, Activities that are happening, some of the normal things, despite the masks that you'd expect to see in a school year. Um, so this was a orchestra winter concert um, held at the uh, multipurpose room in Redwood last uh, on the, two nights ago. So you can see some of the students uh, performing on the stage, uh, decorations, uh, 
it's not like a really good event. Next slide. Sports went on this year, um, and our basketball team, girls sixth and seventh grade, uh, were undefeated. Um, you can see the uh, Manny has, has, I think, the seventh graders, the sixth graders. I'm not sure. I think it's a walk on coach. I'm not sure his name. I apologize. Um, but they have their uh, medals and uh, posing for the picture and celebrating their undefeated season for both those teams. So I think that's fantastic. So congratulations to our athletic program at the middle school. Um, this one is uh, again from the, the winter concert. So you can see um, the, the four different, uh, four different um, performance groups uh, for, from the other night. Looks like we have. And then continuing on um, some examples of what's happening in, in classrooms. First one is makerspace. Um, students working in teams are sawing, they're using the materials, the equipment, um, and uh, just as productive. I was in the makerspace today with Maura in the middle school. Really remarkable things happening. They're doing a golf project. We have pictures of that. The makerspaces are open and we're getting the. Uh, our, our makerspace teacher is making, making her rounds as well as uh, the middle school reopening some of their programs. So they continue around. around. I think that's very right there. Our next uh, slide was the, uh, we went today actually to, uh, they had a, a virtual virtual economy um, at, at Argo and I actually bought, so I bought some stocking stuffers with some tickets. <laughs> Oh, you got a lot. I, was, <laughs> you know, I want to ask them more. Like, I need more tickets. Need more tickets. Uh, so they were each making um, their uh, products to sell. So obviously, there was a paper airplane group. We bought some uh, uh, friendship bracelets, and there was stress toys, um, goo, like a putty, goo putty. I was, I was afraid to open that one, but there was some. <laughs> they're very colorful, and they're very proud of their work. So quite a quite a few. Uh, Tables to, to buy, so that was fun to see. Next, um, yes, very busy, very busy in there today. Um, elementary art classes, you can see um, a teacher working with students. Students are getting a chance to practice their color, color schemes, color wheels. Um, of course, all the students are just religious with the masks, so really appreciate, very diligent. Um, second grade, the Festival of Lights, uh, celebrating a Swedish tradition. And then uh, Kinder Music, so so great. They love it. They're uh, focused, masked, uh, having a really good time in the music room, the, uh, the music, elementary music program. Next slide, please. So um, there is a, in Kinder, they do a flashlight Friday reading project where they read by flashlight. Oh. <laughs> oh, just think that really cute. Um, and just normal recess activities, fun to see, good to see students get to move around um, out there on a dreary day. And then a picture of, of just a third grade classroom. You can see there are students that parents still ask them to have the uh, sneeze guard, which we're happy to do. Uh, and, and so kids are in teams, they're working collaboratively. And then an elementary uh, school science class, um, their teachers going over, oh, sorry, going over lab safety. So they're still able to work in their teams and, and do their projects. And then the next slide, um, first annual, I guess it's called annual second, but it's called first annual dodgeball tournament. In the middle school. And then Club 47 is um, open and students are doing foosball on the right, it looks like, and some other projects, creative projects on the left. Those were students during lunchtime want to come in and have some safe place to be. So I, I think our pictures really illustrate, I know there's frustration, it's not um, exactly like it was before school opened, before the pandemic, but it's pretty close. And I think even those of you who've done classroom visitations, it does feel very, very normal. Uh, even the, uh, we, we hear the music, the, the rhythm of moves is out there. They were doing the cha-cha slide. I tried to run out there because I'm really good at the cha-cha slide, but I got sidetracked by something and I wanted to run out there. The contact tracing got in the way, but I was on my way, so I'll be back. 
Okay, so um, Maura's going to talk a little about the multi-tiered system of support. We wanted to share a video that we shared with all of our um, faculty, so the staff, so they can all move along at the same time as we're developing our foundational knowledge around MTSS and how that supports all students and how it makes sense for us in Saratoga as well as in the District of California. So you can video first. Carry on the next slide if you just go ahead and start the video. Well, he gets that up, and then we have a slide talking about some all the progress that we've made this year around MTSS starting our summer retreat with administrators to our local uh, district design. Right. And maybe that's something we can talk about. What's that? One more chance, and then we have. Hi there. Let's take a quick moment to talk about something you are probably already hearing about, MTSS. What is it you ask? We'll, we'll postpone the video, but we'll just go to our, and we can, we can reload that for, um, and I'll send it up to the board, we can do that in January. Just wanted to show you what teachers are seeing, um, and, um, and then we can talk about the activities that we've been involved with uh, regarding MTSS. And you can see the data walls, or the data talks. Harry, do you just bring the slides back up and we'll go to that next slide? Harry thinks he can get the video up. Do you want to try okay. one more time? Okay. Hi there. Let's take a quick moment to talk about something you are probably already hearing about, MTSS. What is it, you ask? Well, MTSS stands for Multi-Tiered System of Support. I know, it's a mouthful. Let's break it down. California's Multi-Tiered System of Support is a framework designed to help districts and schools address each and every student's academic, behavioral, and social-emotional needs. I know, I know. You're thinking, sounds great, but what is this? How does any of this even work? Well, let me try to answer that. MTSS realigns numerous state, regional, county, district, school, community, and family resources to provide all students challenging and motivating coursework, along with the opportunity to learn in the most inclusive and equitable learning environments possible. As part of that, proven existing programs like positive behavioral intervention and supports, restorative practices, and response to intervention have been integrated into MTSS. In short, it's about taking all the best practices and resources built up over the years and streamlining them so that every student can benefit from all the tools at educators' fingertips. Let's break this down a little bit more. At its core, MTSS uses proven, evidence-based priorities and practices to provide universal support to all students. <laughs> but we know some students behave and learn differently and may require supplemental support in certain areas. <laughs> Finally, a few students may need even more intensified support to meet their needs. Oh, come on. <laughs> These levels of support are available to all students. For example, a student might be doing great academically, but need additional support in social emotional development, or vice versa. Or maybe they only need additional support with learning and math. The system is flexible to what each student requires, and educators will be constantly assessing where their pupils are in each key area. So, what kind of impact can a multi-tiered system of support have? Well, schools can use the MTSS framework to increase attendance, lower dropout and disciplinary rates, improve school climates, and boost academic performance. Because MTSS builds on the strengths of each school's staff and signature programs, it won't necessarily look the same at each school. But common features include collaboration, the use of data, 
differentiated instruction and targeted interventions that kick in before a school or student is failing. MTSS is now being scaled up statewide, marking an important step in California's drive for continuous improvement. We hope you'll be a part of this movement, ensuring the success of all students. For more information, visit the website. And thanks for watching. This video comes out of Orange County Office of Education, who in 2017 was designated as the lead county to support all, uh, all districts across the state. And so uh, for us, one of the things that we really are starting with is trying to get student services before they go down the assessment and especially around the state. We can give them strategies and they can just bounce right back into gen ed. And so uh, that's been sort of our foundational beginning for us. And, and with the social emotional focus that we're seeing across um, across the campuses, that's also an area we're trying to build some of those interventions um, that we can provide students. And so that's our, been our focus um, for the last you know, six months. So, so for, sorry. To, um, so I visited um, Foothill, which um, is uh, a little while ago, and um, Brian, uh, principal White, was commenting that this year there are fewer uh, student uh, call SST meetings because MTSS is helping teachers to kind of catch things sooner and to get resources pulled in before we have to go to the SST meetings, which is, is very labor intensive. And so we're true. getting kids help sooner and putting less of the overhead into it was his general mind. Exactly. And I think uh, that's, for example, they're noticing, and, and uh, we'll talk about the data, the data teams trying to put some data in place. We've sort of been, because our students come so prepared, they get lots of supports from their parents out, outside of school. They pre do pretty well, very well, uh, but we haven't collected a lot of data locally to, to match that. And so particularly around social, emotional, learning, we haven't really tracked that before either. So getting the data in place, and Morris talked about investing, and we're doing, actually next week, there's quite a few vendors that are doing virtual, um, sort of orienting them to their product to get us a data management plan. We've talked about learning management for the user on the, on the student side, but this is for data for us to collect. So it's all in one place that we have data points that we can actually point to uh, before there is a referral to special ed or just catching students before they start to struggle. So on this slide, you can see them in the top picture, that's the Saratoga Elementary Kinder team. And you can see behind them, the data wall is blank. And that's because this was the first morning. They were the first team to go in. The lower picture, you can see um, where the data charts are filled out. Each one of those is a grade level. Each um, piece of paper represents, the one color represents language arts and the other is math. The student's name would be on the back. So they're not identified. What we're looking at is actually just putting them in order according to their scores. And so if you have students that are in the red or even the yellow band, those are the ones that what you're not seeing at the table is the teachers, the specialists, the administrator, um, then having conversations. Some of these kids are already receiving services. And we talk about how they're doing. Some of the kids are not yet receiving services. So we're identifying first step is what will happen in the classroom. So that is often um, the teacher pulling small groups as they're differentiating to reteach or a concept to students that maybe didn't get it the first time. And then secondly, we're identifying whether or not these kids need to have a reading intervention teacher or even an RSP teacher pull them for a small group or push into the classroom in a small group prior to identifying them for any type of special needs assessment. And the idea is that um, we've had kids out of school, you know, in the classroom. Um, everybody, I think, has suffered a, a level of uh, trauma. And we know that that helps shut down parts of the brain. So we don't want to over identify or accidentally identify students at this time. So we're trying to give enough resources as possible um, prior to taking the student to a student study team process. And so that's what you're seeing. We also have um, an MTSS design team and that team has met about every three weeks or so. 
Um, Ken is the lead of that. We also have a um, coordinator from outside the district that helps him plan our agendas, sort of walk us through everything. All of the administrators are part of this team. We also have key players like school counselors, um, teachers at every level from every school, uh, a lot of specialists that are in the district as well. And what we're really doing right now is understanding the depths of MTSS. So what does the framework actually look like? What is MTSS? What we're showing you here is sort of just that Reader's Digest version. So we go into more detail, building understanding. Um, one of the things that we've done, one of the activities, for instance, is building out those triangles of what do we have in place at each level in each subject across each site and then putting the posters up and talking about, well, well, what do we have in common across our sites? Where do we, where are we doing really well? And we wanna make sure we're continuing to support that. And then where do we have some areas that we can grow? Fully understanding that this is a multi-multi-year process. So we don't wanna introduce too many new things too soon, but then prioritizing. What is the first things that we need to start to consider and introduce next year, for instance, or even this spring? And kind of I just point out what having the benefit of a district wide team is we're having these aha is like, oh, you guys do that at start to oh, maybe we can part of the idea is we transport those really good things across the district and, and, and focusing on what we already have the assets we have in place rather than abandoning things that we're not sure that work. And so that's been really uh, fun to watch that process we meet in here and it's been really interactive and, and um, eye opening because we're a small district, but yet we don't exactly do anything similarly. And there's some really good things happening. Want to share across the district. Um, and then the next thing, part of this um, process is to really look at data. And so the data talks are what we just, I described to you, what you're seeing in the pictures. And then Ken mentioned to you that we are looking at hopefully implementing a data management system next year um, in the fall. So we have our first um, date next Wednesday that we're going to look just a very brief view, an hour long over the five different systems. And we have the administrators, the middle school counselors, um, the tech team is there, the whole tech team will be there listening. And this first step is really just, which ones are even feasible? Like, um, and, and then once we've narrowed it down to ones that we think, this one will work with power school, this one looks like it's user friendly enough. Hopefully getting it down to two or three, then we're gonna be bringing in teachers to the next session and we'll be really looking at pros and cons. The biggest users of the data management system typically are administrators. They're the ones having to sort of crunch the numbers, but then also specialists because, or any teacher that is gonna bring up a student for student study team or a cost team review, they want to be able to look at you know, past history, past report cards, and have all of the information in one place. The other thing that's really nice about a data management system is when one of us administrators leaves and everything was kept in a Google Doc, you often are left struggling for where that disappeared to. And so having one solid place helps us keep a history. So that was, we're starting that process. It will probably be uh, you know, a six to eight month process um, to even start it. So then the next thing we have going on is cost. So that's the coordinator of services team. This is um, when we look at the kids on these data walls that are perhaps in the red, but maybe they're not identified yet for any type of special ed services, but we haven't actually given them the time in intervention before we might want to bring them up for a student studies uh, team. So we're looking, a cost team can sort of be preventative. And so you're thinking this child, I don't really know if there's some serious problems or if they've just been not in the classroom enough. And so the teachers can bring them up. They can talk about just a, a plethora of ideas that they can do in the classroom to help these students. And also maybe have um, them have some push-in services, that type of thing, and see if we can solve the problem before we have to take them to an SST process. After a, you know, a portion of time, if we're not seeing reasonable growth, then it goes to the SST process. But cost is just that very first step of being as proactive as possible. Um, and then um, 
that's really basically that's what we've done so far. The last um, bullet there is just looking at programs where there are needs, and that's sort of integrated throughout each of these things, steps. That you're and if I just contextualize, because Cynthia brought up the it was talked about the second graders aren't doing handwriting very well. So in an old thinking, you could prefer that student to get an IP and have an occupational therapist work with them. Or we talked about could occupational therapists provide perhaps 30 minutes after school for four weeks and would that resolve the issue for so the specialist can actually come in and be um, early intervention rather than coming afterwards and saying, well, this is the student. So those are the, just a small example of taking the data what came out of the data talks looking at our current resources, there are a different way to think about these resource people, folks, before the student comes up on IEP. So that's kind of an example. We also noticed that from the data talks, there were some general themes that were noticed across the board. You know, students maybe not as far along as they would have been with executive function. And so that in that, it, it tells us, okay, this is a type of concern that we have school-wide, possibly district-wide, because we've only gone through Saratoga Elementary and Redwood so far, and we're starting uh, next week. We'll be going to uh, Foothill, and then at the end of, uh, actually after break, we'll finish up Foothill and Argo. So we're starting to see some things, and that might lead us to what type of professional development do we want for teachers as well. Next slide here. So we did have um, some really oh, positive. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay, questions. Okay, sorry about that. Questions. <laughs> On the um, the services, the cost services um, in the past for an IEP that's done with parent permission, all the testing, and, and that whole process is done with parents. How much involvement at this point are pushing in or offering additional services? So it, even before a student is brought up for cost, a parent should be very aware from even a parent conference or parent phone calls that there is some concern, not to the level of concern that we're pulling them out of the classroom for intervention, but that we're a little bit concerned. We're keeping an eye on them. Some suggestions here are some things you could be doing at home. Here's what we're doing in the classroom. That's happening prior to a class meeting. Um, and all of what's happening in a class meeting is conveyed to a parent. And you know, we have some concerns that we're going to try some things here at school. We're hoping to uh, catch them up before anything goes any further. And that would be the majority of students. When, if it is not successful, then it goes to student study team. And that's still prior to any type of assessment. And at that point, a parent is actually invited into the meeting and they're, they're there for the process. And that from there, it might be um, more intensive intervention. Again, still not signing an assessment, but, but up, upping what we're doing for the student. And if that round isn't working, then we, we may look at um, signing an assessment. But, so the parents involved from the very beginning, uh, they might not be called in for an official meeting because it's not that serious yet. But if their student is being uh, hold for, say, a social-emotional group, of course, they're going to be told, you know, yeah, prior to, they would have been communicated either with, you know, phone calls, parent conference, something like that, but there's, there's a mild concern, um, but not anything to get alarmed about at, the, at that beginning level, and that's we're hoping, that's as far as we, as it goes, and then the next phone call could be, hey, guess what, they're on grade level. <laughs> Uh, just a quick word to our uh, viewing public here. Um, as we go through this, if, if you're going to want to make a public comment, uh, it'd be great if you could just go ahead and hit that raise hand feature. I've got my eye on the list here, and then I'll know when we need to stop and, and fit you in at the best possible time. Okay, back to you. So um, we started to collect some data on uh, child nutrition. Uh, some concerns were brought forward around the menu, and Jane jumped right in and responded very quickly. He got a hold of Sodexo and started a, a menu, uh, kind of a parent committee about menu options. And so uh, she shared those with me. I want to make sure we celebrate sort of taking some concerns and, and making some corrective action. And um, she's going to share with you some of the data about participation from family or students at schools around with the lunch program. Um, so I was excited this last week because we started seeing um, quite a bit more participation in our lunch program due to some of the changes that we've made. Um, 
And then just some of the parents too, bring in ideas and things like that. We've done some taste testings, things like that with kids, getting their feedback as well. The salad bars, we were able to get reopened, which made a big difference at the school sites. Those are highly popular and supplements the food besides the meal, because that's a concern because some parents felt their kids weren't getting enough food. So the salad bar is an addition to the meal that they can get. So that was kind of adding more. Um, this year, we had the option of adding some soups. So they were going to try that for December. So um, that's kind of exciting. They did do a milk pilot because we had a few parents that felt like chocolate milk was not something we should be offering, even though it's a, a low fat milk, they were concerned about the sugar. So um, we explored by offering two different white milks instead and saw a dramatic decrease in the amount of milk that kids are drinking. And although we know milk, chocolate milk is, you know, kind of got this kind of bad thing to it, it also provides the calcium content that the kids need as well. So it's kind of hit and miss about whether we do that. So I think we kind of were able to show that it, it really greatly affected how much calcium they were taking in and the other vitamins they get from milk. So I'm um, kind of putting that chocolate milk back on that thing, which makes the kids happy. So, because <laughs> um, they don't probably get that at home. So, um, and then more vegan options. There's a stir fry tofu that they were going to put in. Um, tofu itself doesn't have a lot of nutritional content, but we can add it to things very easily. So, they were adding things like that. And they were going to try to do, um, we did get some chicken alfredo that they're going to taste test with the kids at the elementary level and see how they like that to give them a different option. Um, some of the guidelines were lifted, so we're not having to do like the whole wheat pasta as much and things like that, which the kids don't like. We're able to go to more of the white pasta, which is more popular. So just trying to expand um, for different cultures as well. So it's been successful that you can see that before the changes, um, part breakfast participation was at 32%. And the breakfast program was new to expansion to all the school sites this year. So that was relatively new but it was a little bit lower in the morning and the lunch participation is 39%, which has been our trend in the last few years. So that's a, not unique, but with the new menu items, the breakfast participation, especially since we were able to add hot meals in the morning, jumped to 48% and our lunch participation is running at least 50%. Recently, it's been over that many days. And that's a big difference for us, especially when we're getting an increased rate this year, which is helping offset some of those food costs and things, even though Sodexo pays for that and it doesn't affect our contract, it greatly affects their ability to do things as well. So, um, so it's nice. It's good to see that participation increase. So breakfast increased 50% and lunch at 28.2%. So we're excited. Questions or comments on that? So I just have one quick question that I know before the pandemics, well, the salad bar student can serve by themselves, but how long now? They can serve themselves. Okay, so I need to look at that years. recently. Okay, so do we give them some like you know, the guidance, some safety measures, how to serve the salad bar? Correct. So before um, they were requiring, before they recently looked at the measures from the health department, um, they were required to prepackage every little item on the salad bar, which made it very difficult for staff to do, especially when there's only one staff working, you know, three hours away at coffee drink. Um, so now that you can serve yourself, there's hand sanitizer, all kids have to go in and hand sanitize, they have to wear their mask when they're getting at the cell bar. They have those cautions and protections. They uh, use their own utensils. So it's just, it's it's a safety thing. So and we have it monitored as well. So um, they're doing very well. Okay, next slide. So I have a few operate, operational updates around um, COVID. I sent some emails to you. We had a busy week of uh, cases, so I'll talk a little bit about how we manage those. Um, so I do want to, we are really proud to offer our second uh, vaccine clinic on Sunday. I have about 12 staff uh, coming in, uh, including more. Jean and I will be there too. And uh, we have about 350, 60 signed up so far. Um, as you know, um, the CDC or the FDA, which is what authorized boosters for 16 and 17 year olds. So um, we will, we're pushing that out. I think something went out earlier today. Um, we're connecting, we connected with the high school district so they can broadcast that for students who want to come locally. Um, so we did have uh, a, a few of our parent groups pushed out last, our, our adult boosters last weekend. So we had a lot of walk-ins, which 
any adult who get any adult who gets boosted helps all of us so that we're happy to oblige that so we go to we're nine to three uh at argonaut on sunday okay next slide um we wanted to announce and i we shared this with um scf um, and, and also our parent i had a special meeting of all parent leaders as well as administrators and administrative assistants on the guidelines that i'll go over in just a moment um so we um I was listening to a report today, surveillance testing is so important as we're experiencing a surge. And so we wanted to offer a curative at the district office. Um, they'll be here on New Year's Eve for families that are getting ready to come back to school. Um, so far, they've been remarkably quick with their, uh, with their return turnaround time for the tests, although it's slowing down because I think a lot of folks around the state are testing. And so uh, December 31st, and they can sign up, they'll be open, I think, for six or seven hours that day. Um, and then, of course, any family can access testing to the county through the providers. Um, and we're doing voluntary student testing on Monday, January 3rd, Tuesday, January 4th, just as another mitigation um, strategy. Of course, students will already be in campus, and if there was to be a positive case, that will, you know, but we're, we're just encouraging families to test, especially if they're traveling, seeing where the travel is causing um, community spread uh, and we'll continue to do voluntary student testing every friday um, curative works really well for fan for student testing but and at the district office but it has to be an adult when we do it during school we don't have to adults give permission and we act instead for the parents and do the testing but when it's off-site like that the parent has to come with the child or a guardian i don't know if they actually check who the adult is when you go but uh, Anyway, that's that's the only kind of limitation with student testing through our district office pop up. A quick question for you, Ken. Um, we had a, a email to the board. I think it was yesterday. Um, somebody suggesting that um, we should actually uh, revert to distance learning only the first week after break uh, because of concerns about um, uh, outbreaks happening. Could you respond to that? Yeah, I, I know colleges are doing that. Um, I, we have some staff who has children, uh, adult, they're, they're uh, young adults in college and, and they are, some colleges are reverting to that for the first two weeks because they're fearful of the travel. Um, we don't have the authority to do, to revert everybody to distance learning, only if there are, uh, that one case early on when we discovered that the water drinking in class creates close contacts that we actually, the teacher and the students went online, but we don't have the authority to do that. Um, so that's why we're really encouraging um, testing if people are traveling or having a lot of folks in, you know mixing generations at a household uh, for holidays so i think um, i understand that parents concern and that certainly is a concern for us um, and it's a concern for us for a variety of reasons Our, i feel like my ultimate goal and my priority is to have eight to three stay open and have students in class the pictures that you saw we want to continue that um, the challenge when we have cases we had in a short week's time, we had four, four positive cases. One was a trip uh, to a competition in Dublin. And so uh, that is was a complicated case. And then we've had two staff cases and a student close contact case in one day. And uh, we have a remarkably skilled and experienced COVID team that does contact tracing well. We have automation to keep track of who was in places. We do QR codes, we keep emails. So that's the automated part, but to do effective contact tracing prior to interviews. So uh, just to contextualize, my team's passionate about this. They love doing this. They are happy to do this. Nobody's complaining about this. But my the impact on the district and on students is that it took three people 10 hours. They didn't leave till seven last night. It took part of my day. We're happy to do that. Uh, but if we had more cases come in, we couldn't effectively contact trace. That's the problem. So if we had... Um, the case of the 43 students and eight adults that went to Dublin. Uh, if we didn't know what car, if, if uh, the, the teacher did not keep track of who was in which car and, and who went, uh, we would have to just blanketly assume everybody's a close contact, which creates panic for parents. They have to go get, they should go get tested day one, day five. But because the teacher had good records, because that was the deal, just keep records of where people are, and we will jump in and help you with the rest so that he was able to narrow it down to one adult and I think eight students that got the close contact notice. Everybody else got the routine, or I've had, I don't know how many secondary contact notices I've seen. 
I don't pay attention so much anymore because I know it's very um, it, unlikely that I've had exposure. But if you give everybody that close contact, that's alarming and it's disruptive and parents have to go out and find tests and they should go out and find tests. So that's why the contact tracing is so important. It's so time consuming and the interviews can't be automated. So that's what takes so much time. So there's an impact. They're not doing what they normally do during the day. They're not doing the HR work. They're not doing school nurse work. They're doing this, which they're very good at. And they, I, I believe they're really, they, they know it's important. They're passionate about it. But it does have an impact in that if we have multiple cases pile up, we simply can't do it. It's not that we're too tired or that we don't want to. It's there just isn't the time to do it. And, and we have to put it on the back burner. So you've lost two days where people are out and about doing whatever. So you know, then potentially spreading that. So uh, that was, you know, it's just very time consuming. It's important work and we don't want to shortchange that because then we have to give universal close contacts to people. And that's, that's not good. And then people are going to get those so much that they're not going to believe those. And then it loses the integrity of the contact tracing. So right now we're able to manage it. Um, but like we had three cases one day followed by two days prior, we had the other case. And so um, we know that simply keeping records of who was there and hopefully where they were makes a huge impact and gives you gives targeted people the information that likely had a close contact versus just sort of saying we don't know who was where and so that that's our concern because then um, the worst call that we make um, and i don't make them christina makes them is to tell the parent sorry you have to quarantine for seven days or you have to do a modified quarantine you can come to school but you can't do after school and Parents may not honor that if they're going outside, or if they're in the school play rehearsal, we'll know. Um, but we can't monitor, you know, if they're going to a soccer club or a Boy Scout. We just, that, that's out of our purview. Um, but that's the reason why that public health wants, it's prioritizing in-school instruction over most. So that's why they're saying, still go to school, but please don't expose yourself or expose others to these after-school mixed groups. So, um, I have every confidence our team is really skilled because they do it a lot, um, but we did get, we're seeing an uptick and I, I, we, we are in community spread. We had two staff, we had some, a parent traveled out of state, came back from, so we have community spread, so we just have to contain that as much as we can. I'm kind of outside of 83, it's happening in the past. Our ability to do tracing, like you mentioned, play rehearsal, or if there's an after school activity that's held on. Campus or something like the audience. So that's a great question. So, um, what uh, uh, one of our uh, neighboring district was doing was anything after three o'clock, they were saying that's not, that's outside the school day. And then the public health rules changed. I shared with you, I think last board meeting, they changed the Monday and we met on Thursday. They said it doesn't matter if it's school sponsored, if it's on your campus, the agency, us, have to conduct that. And that's why we're turning to our partners, such as PTA. SEF, those that are running events that are through our schools. So we have, I've convened them, brought them together, and that's another slide, but went through, but, but I wanted to preview with them before I preview with you before we could move forward, is that these are the, the rules that we're going to, to follow. Um, so yeah, anytime you're bringing adults on, it just adds, it adds to contact tracing. It's not to say that we won't do it. It's just that we're asking the parent leaders, if you're running this, we will absolutely meet with you. I know. Um, Christina and Kim are meeting with the Moana PTA group who's doing the ticketing and the advertising to just to make sure they have everything understood and what, what role they need to do, what we will do if something were to happen. So essentially, we're just asking whoever's running the event, whether it's a parent or a staff, have really good records, know where people were, and then we can take over and do those interviews. And because we can't ask, parents can't do that. There's something that we wouldn't expect that. But if we don't have anything to work with, then contact tracing just as a possible. So if I as a parent come to an event and later I test positive and I say, hey, I was positive, I was at this event, would you turn to me and ask me who did I interact with? Would you assume everyone? Ab absolutely, that's this? part of the interview. So you would report to us that you had a positive case. Um, if it's in an assembly type situation, that's why we're really asking whoever's running it, you sell tickets and you go to, if you go to a, most places, in most theaters, you have a seat assignment or a therapy seat assignment. Then we know who is near you because you may not know who's in front of you, but we're trying to at least narrow it down so we're not sending out ostensibly 500 close contacts. We're really trying to minimize the alarm 
target the people who probably should go get tested and be alerted. And then the rest of the people at the event, because they signed up to tickets, they purchased online, we know where their email address that we sent out together 360 people. 40 might get a close contact, 360 would just get a, there was COVID in the room. You're, you're probably fine, but you need to be aware. So I think that's the, the larger the group, the harder that is. And so then the call would be the status who, do you remember who you sat with? Well, my mom, my dad. Okay, so we'll have to give us, we have their names, we'll, we'll give them. Who was in front? Did you go to the bathroom? Were you there for 15 minutes? Did you take your mask off? So those are the questions that can't be automated. And I know automation is, is, I'm hearing that, and we do that with QR codes. When, I, when we walked on campuses, we do it, various rooms, and then we're on record here in case there was a, in case there was a positive case, we might get a secondary notice. So that's the tricky part with uh, the larger groups. So we're, we're just assuming some risk, there's gonna be risk. I mean, I assume when I walk into the airport where we were, I'm assuming somebody had COVID in the airport, right? But I was having a mask on, so I'm fine. But we have to ask those questions. Were you eating? Did you take your mask off? Um, who did you sit near? Uh, who were you with, you know, le less than six feet around? And, and the county department of health is requiring us to do this. Yeah, this is part of um, con the, the contact tracing requirements from public health. Is, is That's what they say. It's best to don't eat inside. Eat, and I have some of those to share with you. Smaller groups are better. Try not to bring in unvaccinated if you have you moderate to high community spread, and we're in moderate spread in our county. Yep. We don't have this the colors anymore, but we're mm -hmm. orange. So, so again, our team is really good at contact tracing. They don't complain. Christina was at her daughter's wedding, and we called her, and she stepped out happily to, to start it. So there's no more committed group. So it's not a complaint about the time. It's that if we have a lot of these stack up, that's going to be hard for us to manage. And then we just do the blanket close contact and then some people may be asked not to do after school activities and we just want to we want to keep kids we don't want to have any kid quarantined at home that's our confidentiality reasons this isn't something call up some volunteer parents and be like hey can you help us contact trace no the parent volunteers can help you know if you're you know when i went to a restaurant in the coon yard the hostess asked me for my she looked at my life my phone and my license i went in so that that kind of stuff we is, is people parent any you know teacher volunteers can do parent volunteers can do but it gets to interviewing we wouldn't ask somebody to do that i haven't even done the interviews i haven't been trained i know i hear it well i come in and i see kim's door closed i know it's not good because she doesn't close the door unless she's doing those that's how i knew we had now a couple of cases on thursday uh oh kim's room's closed that's not good and then ray says have you talked to kim uh i know we've got some cases then so, um, so yeah, parents are a great partnership at the, at the foundational part, collecting the data. If they've sold tickets, just can you turn, we don't need it until something happens and you give us your spreadsheet. We'll help you send out, we have the templates for you. You've got your distribution list, plug and go. And then, and then if somebody comes out positive, we'll take over and do the actual interviews when they need to happen. So we're not asking parents to do something outside of, you know, really it's, it's just a one, it's like a couple extra steps collecting who's there and keeping their, and if they can, get sort of a seating chart. As you know, when we, um, our, our big aha from the uh, one class that we ended up closing because so many kids were potentially exposed, is that when we learned, okay, we need to have students sit by lunch group so that we can do contact tracing. We have to ask the kid, who are you sitting next to? I mean, it's, it's lengthy, but that's what we learned. That was our aha, so we haven't had to do that. We haven't had to quarantine a class again because we stopped the drinking in class and um, we're just, kids are sitting by kind of by stable cohorts at lunch, which makes it really efficient when things happen. So this slide I wanted to um, share with you because the uh, health, public health is now allowing the rapid antigen test to be permissible for uh, positivity or negative test results. But Santa Clara County is currently saying it has to be um, done with a healthcare provider. So I think there are some places you can go and they will kind of like the pod, but with the rapid test. So this kind of describes um, the one thing I want to point out, if you're asymptomatic and your antigen, the rapid test comes back positive, if you think you're, it's really negative, you can go get a PCR test within 24 hours and that will overturn the first positive test and it can become negative. So that's, Kind of the one that I think is interesting. Um, 
And then if you do, if you've lost your taste and smell, which is the hallmark of COVID, um, and you get a negative test on antigen, the antigen, you 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 need to go do a because you've got the you've got the symptoms, but the test didn't uh, come as negative, so you want to go get a PCR test. All right, rapid antigen is that something that the curative testing site could start to offer? So the minute that within like an hour, so Christina and I, or she sent it to me here, we can now use this antigen. And then we got an email like two hours later saying, but there's no supply. We can do it, but we can't get supply. So um, cool. they were just wrapped up in a, in, a, in a minute they were ordered. So hopefully the supply chain will catch up. Anything else about that? Uh, so here, um, these are, the, um, I wanted to share with you the requirements for after school events activities. Um, we did hold, I have a special meeting, um, as I mentioned, um, we had all trying to get all people in the same room to hear the same thing. And we got some good feedback, Kim is working on a packet. So they'll have all the documents. We're also um, thinking about a consent document so that uh, if, if um, we have more parent volunteers that are gonna get access to some things that they, they know that you know, your information may be shared as part of contact tracing. So, um, so we're working on that. Um, but I, as I mentioned to you, the next biggest event we have is uh, the musical at, at Redwood. And so they are meeting as, with the district team just to go over everything, make sure everybody feels comfortable. I think there's a lot of anxiety about that. Um, I think parent, every, everybody's just a little bit nervous. I think they're nervous about asking people for vaccination status. I think there's a lot around that. Um, so the, the comments that Alicia made earlier about how difficult that is in this meeting, you'll try to address that and understand more what she's talking mm -hmm. about and how we can try to make some progress. Yeah. Uh, and so again, the message is it's a partnership with all, all groups that are uh, wishing to host things that we, uh, we have the technical knowledge to do the heavy stuff if there is for contact tracing, we just need parents to do that extra step of that they're not used to collecting emails, collecting names, and then Ideally, figuring out where people are having a seating arrangement where there's a seat number like in an airplane, not Southwest, but every other airplane where you get to have a seat assignment. And if we can't do that, we just have to end up blanketly sending things out. And I think it's going to cause alarm. And and and, and, and the ultimate consequence is people may not want to show up and they may stay because if you get too many of those, you may say, I, I got to go test again. So I don't know. You're trying to find the balance. Um, so uh, next slide. We can talk a little about. So these are the protocols we went over. Um, they're all part of the Department of Public Health um, guidance. The one part that uh, my staff, we've taken a position and the board can have this discussion and decide if there is conflict with that, um, is that we are saying be vaccinated to come into um, an event, um, an extracurricular event, an event that's not, you know, not required. And so um, there's two things. One is I'm hearing from parents that are nervous about checking vaccine status, but you can, it's pretty quick on the phone. But then now if we allow this 72 hour before the event negative test, how you can, you know what the card looks like, you know what the, the card, physical card or your picture from my vaccine you get from the state, but then trying to decipher three days, counting back 72 hours, it, it does put more of a burden on, on who's watching kind of the bouncer at the room. So that's one little like logistical thing, and then you might get a backup. But secondly, um, we've demanded all of our teachers, every one of our teachers has gotten vaccinated. Um, we've been saying as a board, and Eric, and Eric's not here, he's been very clear, like everybody needs to get vaccinated. And then if we say, well, you can show a negative test, I, I think, I don't know, it's a bit of a mixed message. Um, so that's our you know staff's position. Um, but you know, there's other perspectives. All out our there. volunteers have to be vaccinated. All of our volunteers no choice on that. Um, we're saying be vaccinated. So if there's a different um, idea, you know, that's, that's a, a board can ultimately say, you know, let's allow negative tests. Um, and, and we can't ask if it's they're fragile or if it's religious. I mean, it's just, it's either a vaccine or a test. So uh, it just becomes a little bit more onerous and it just seems to be a little riskier um, as we're in a moderate spread, uh, but it's, that is the one element that's permissible by public health versus the other rules are, that's what we're following. So I know you had a question about that. I've heard other questions. So let's talk about it. I want to kind of I need to move past this um, because we just have other things to do and it keeps coming up as a concern. And so let's put it out there. And if there's other thoughts, we're, we're open. Okay. Um, 
So you're the um, bosses, so we I'm open, right? So so we're not talking about people who are not eligible. So if I have a four year old child right. and I'm comfortable bringing the four year old, then that's not a problem. So that's a great point. So let me clarify. So right now we're saying twelve and up will need to show proof. The Moana we worked with um, the Moana group that's leading it. Their their flyer says that twelve and up be prepared to show proof of vaccine. Um, in March, we may say now everybody 12 and under has had ample time to get vaccinated. Maybe that's the time we go down to five. Um, you all familiar with Via Montago, they have a performance area. So they're, and they're not a school, but they are saying five and up must be vaccinated. Five and under, you got to show your test. So they're taking, that's the, probably the most rigorous, most um, restrictive, but that's a position that it's valid too. So I, right now we're saying 12 and up because five to 12 really haven't been finished and, and January 15th is around the corner. And so parents may be on the sidelines for a month or two, which is totally understandable as well. So we may revisit that when we start to um, see more families, get, you know, children getting vaccinated. So my seven-year-old, you aren't even gonna say, I have to go get them a test. It's just 12 and up, yeah. vaccinated under that. Oh, we just recognize that that's not time to do that yet. Right, and we may adjust that. Just, just to be clear, but I want to make sure I understand this. The um, the county only requires masks. Right? Is that right? They don't require any vaccination. That's something we're, we're deciding. The, the masks and the, recommend, the vaccination or a negative test within 72 hours. Is there a recommendation? Not a requirement, right? But, but is that true or is that? Let me double back just that I don't want to misspeak. And I have Christine. Yeah, yeah, no, I, no, let me that's all I was I think it's um, I think it's under a additional considerations. Um, last week. Last. I think it says schools should limit non-essential visitors, volunteers, and activities involving external groups, organizations, with people who are not fully vaccinated, particularly in areas where there's moderate to high. COVID-19 community transmission. So there, that part is- there. And then COVID-19 is strongly recommended for all eligible people. So we could just have to just, we just do masks too. If that's the direction, that's, I, I, that, I that's the requirement. Yeah, that's, you're right, that's the requirement. Um, and in this county, you go to restaurants, I have to show mine if I don't have a vaccine, I have to sit outside. I mean, that's, I've been, if you've been out and about, mostly places are, a lot of places are requiring it, but. You go into Kohl's, you don't have to show vaccine. This isn't a department store, but this is a school. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I would say this is not a department store, this is a school, and, and we need to protect the kids. And um, I don't know if people signing their kids up to participate in these events are comfortable with a bunch of you know, people showing up who, who have not been uh, proven that they, they are safe to be there. So you might have more parents saying, I, I'm not going to be able to let my, my child, I don't feel comfortable letting my child be in the school play if I know there are going to be people in the audience who are not vaccinated. Or they, or they have done due diligence to make sure that this, this audience is as safe as possible, um, which is what we're doing to keep the kids in school. You know, we're, we're making sure all the staff, all the teachers, everyone who visits the school is, is vaccinated or on the testing regimen. So to suddenly open up the doors and let anybody in who wants to show up um, feels very mixed, very mixed to me. I think for me, you know, for the events or the you know sport tournament and the speech debate tournaments, if I know the day exactly which days, and so I know some people will do the you know test the three days before. Sometimes they require two days before. Because you know, we do need to know that someone who might have religion or you know the health concern, like some people, they want to see their relatives. Um, I mean, the musical performance, but they are not able to do that. But they are willing to do the test. So are we zooming out? Like the play is being zoomed out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Then uh -huh. it's good to know. Then we yeah. should let the parents or the relatives know that you know. Yeah, if this is our rule and we have to make it clear and we have to do this, you know, like to all the events and then we'll provide the, you know, the 
Yeah, so just to just point the agencies, organizations have discretion and to do things more rigorous or less. Uh, for example, uh, some dist half the districts in the county are not doing science camp. They've just made that decision. We are still on the science camp route. So it's not always the same at every district. They've made those decisions. So this is the four of you decide that and tell me and we'll accommodate. I think science camp, I would love to keep science camp. Yeah. Oh, I'm talking about this part. I, mean, I just I was using the example. Yes, we're we intend to do science camp unless we have a lot of camp. We just need to, you know, we're going to sample when we get back in January. I'm just saying at this point, there's lots of different ways to approach it. And so if there's different, if there's thoughts that this isn't the right way to go, please tell me so we can make those adjustments. It's entirely up to you. Do you have some camp? Uh, yes, we do. Um, so let's let's make the assumption that postulates about this. And um, Grace, could, uh, I see two hands up. Could you uh, let them have an opportunity to uh, give us a comment here? Sure, uh, Alicia. Um, thank you for talking about the Moana play. And Melissa, I just board member Melissa, I just want you to realize that we just came out of an orchestra performance from the high school, and. It's the same community, we were masked and they didn't go through all this extra precaution. And also you must remember, just as the high school offered live streaming, we are also offering live streaming. So if you are truly uncomfortable with sending your child who is unvaccinated or, or you are uncomfortable, then you don't need to go. You can live stream the event. It's not, it's, I, I think that we are in a good district, in a good county. I think the vaccine numbers are beautiful, even January, even better because younger kids are getting vaccinated. I think we are making a mountain out of a molehill. You always have the choice to watch the play at home. We, we, we shouldn't be drastic. We have to be reasonable. But that's it. I have good news as well. I'm also in the ticketing. So, Ken, I will take you up on that offer of sitting with, with the ticketing staff from Moana to get things straight with the nurse. I will take you up on that one. But I will say that we have already in the system the people exactly where they're seated, their names, the group number. We have It's better than the airport. It's better than the restaurant. There's no eating inside. There, there is a sense of control. And there's, you shouldn't fear because we are equipped and now have everything documented to know and help you contact Trace if there were a need. At the moment, for the, all the high school events, zero need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia. Who's next? Uh, Vandana Prabhu. Uh, hi, thank you for uh, discussing the plan. Finally, uh, I think this is the right direction because we do want to plan for more events and hopefully with Moana, we will e uh, straighten out our processes, which uh, is what we've been waiting for this long. Um, what I want to say is I think when we look at those recommendations, we are in a district and in a community which is highly vaccinated and very aware. And so I feel, I feel like we're taking, uh, again, overcomplicating the issue because we have seen the same community at the high school. And I've personally been to the play um, at the high school. And the one thing that Mr. Gisek said about the negative test, I think we need to start thinking ahead because even with vaccinations, ultimately, you want a negative test. And my point being that, yes, we don't want the burden on the parent volunteers, thank you, but we could look into systems that can help take that burden off going forward across the district. So think about policies that, you know, are not policies, but think about how we can improve this so that we can have a facility for negative testing. I very much appreciate the district um, testing facility. So surveillance testing will be the way forward and we need a way to basically check negative test status within so many hours um, at some point, if not for Moana. And um, I think for Moana, 
if there's a will, we can make this happen because there are medical conditions that can prevent people from vaccinations. Uh, the airports take the negative test. So maybe we can send out the message that if you have a condition for vaccination that you can't be, write to us and work it out. So I urge you to think, think about some solutions that uh, will make this possible. And of course, for people to stay at home if they are not comfortable. Thank you, Vandana. Um, I have a couple, just a couple of thoughts here. Um, uh, if we ever get caseloads down, I'm gonna feel different about things than where they are right now. I'm, I'm feeling more nervous right now because it seems like caseloads are going up, not down. Um, so there, there is that element of in, in me, and I admit that's, that's my personal um, view about the situation. Uh, we have kids who signed up um, to be in Milano. We have staff who signed up to do it. And um, I am concerned that come January, we could be in a position, we could easily be in a position where you'd have some member of staff or one of those kids who says, you know what, the situation's turned around. And I don't want to be in a room where there's 500 people and 90% of them are vaccinated because... 10% is 50 people in there. Um, so I, I feel it's premature to say uh, that we would we would just let people test in 72 hours in advance. I'm sorry, that, that doesn't really tell you a whole lot. I mean, somebody's got a lot of time in 72 hours to get sick. Um, I'm, I understand the one about some people can't get vaccinated. Frankly, I can't figure out why a person who has an underlying medical condition that's that severe wouldn't be able to get vaccinated, but their doctor would think they should be in an indoor event where people are that close with other people who might not be vaccinated. So I'm, somebody needs to explain that one to me. Maybe then I'll get it. Yeah, maybe I can explain to that. Someone who has a blood clot, you know, you wouldn't see them differently from other Sorry, who has a what? Blood clot. Blood clot. Blood clots. Yes. And so maybe this is not a direct. I mean, um, direction from the doctor, but the family do have a concern and they have this blood clot, you know, since, I mean, it's a family history. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just thinking that, you know, because I have a family member who really cannot be vaccinated and uh, it's extremely helpful. And uh, it's just like very unfortunately, there are some, you know, occasion he couldn't go, but I'm just thinking there's people in our community. And when you talk about that, people who have been vaccinated, it's like, a, they are safer than the one who didn't. I'm not sure about that because look at the high schools. The recently a few cases is the students who have been vaccinated and they got, you know, the mm -hmm. positive. So, I will say that, you know, if you want to make this to be fair and open, and I will request everyone, either you, you got vaccinated or not, you should get a test. To require a test for everybody. Yes. Hmm. For everybody? Yeah, it's even safer, right? Because sure, right sure, now, yes. and the, consider the new variant, and uh, because, you know, I, I just feel that, you know, at least uh, the events I, I went to in the past, you know, they provide the two options. You can like, you know, down the days from three days to two days, you know, and uh, I, I don't know. I so, just, so my, my, might be misunderstanding what you're saying. Are you saying whether you're vaccinated or not, all of the audience members should be required to get a test? Is that what you said? If you consider that we want to have like you know extremely safe place for oh, everyone, just ask them. Ask me. Oh yeah. I didn't understand. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because recently I just learned that you know a few cases in high school is the students who get vaccinated already and they still got a positive COVID. So all the cases that we've had, they're all vaccinated. They're yeah, vaccinated, so, carrying the vac carrying the, the virus around. Yes. Um, they're not symptomatic, but they're carrying it. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So when I think, you know, if we really want to have a like a very extremely safe place for the students and the staff and the audience, then we should go that direction, right? So 
what I'm saying is that there's always risk there. And so we should do what we can do maximum, but still consider someone who couldn't get vaccinated. And just like a, the other events and the occasion, they provide both options. And uh, to me, obviously I couldn't understand that we couldn't do that. And uh, can I totally understand that you put extra burdens on the staff and uh, someone and uh, I also understand that, you know, we might send the wrong message to the community that, okay, you don't need to get vaccinated, you know, as long as you can send in the, you know, negative the uh, result here. But what I'm saying is that, you know, this can be with us for a long time. And uh, the decision we make right now can affect the, the following events. Well, I think that this is, I think it's also possible we say we're, we're going to wind up having to revisit this every quarter for a while. Yeah. COVID yeah. Does. Well, yeah, I think so. And some of it, I mean, with, with a lot of this, this is what we're deciding to do above what the county is specifically saying to do, but we're looking at their recommendations. We're trying to decide what the recommendations. Um, I think it's worthwhile to look at things like what the high school is doing and what other districts are doing. They're all, it's all over the map. Yeah. Some I have talked to you about the athletics, for example. One district we play, they don't let any spectators in that are um, under 18 that can't get vaccinated. Others, you get one guest. So every, every community is making different decisions um, based on the guidance and the recommendations. Half, this, half the districts aren't going to science camp. There's no recommendations that you can't. We're so you know, comparing is fine, but they, the spread is a lot different in East Side. They're not going to, um, you know, going to see a science camp. They, they've got too much in their community. Uh, and high schools, presumably, are making very different decisions because their population has been eligible for vaccination for some right. time now, and they've now already they get had the booster. Now they can get boosters, or part of the part of the community. Right. So, so this is a, we've made our position as a staff. You can you you let us know what you want to do, so we can move on. Does this mean that uh, things like sporting events there? In order to have anyone there, you have to check vaccinations on the way in for, for people in and out of the district. For um, for probably not for outside events, but for indoor events. Sorry, indoor events like like basketball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're we're consistent across we're the consistent, different kinds yeah. of events. And you would just have to advertise that to the other schools so they know. Right, like they tell us, we have a small gym, no guests. You only have one guest, so that's because the conditions are a little bit different. Um, our multi our middle school is a little bit bigger, so we can, you know, ostensibly have, you know, we wouldn't have to limit guests uh, because they can fit. But Cambrian, they have a much smaller uh, facility than we do. And Jen's managed to figure all that out. But they have different requirements. The other schools are the ones with the requirements. We don't do the requirements of the school. So we follow their requirements. You yeah. show up. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, like here, the current thing that you described here is we will require anyone that wants to come to watch from either team to have a vaccine, yeah. a vaccine. So for example, we are allowing vaccinated volunteers. That was a local decision said we will have, and we've expanded and we said vaccination. That was our choice. The staff, that's the record. That's what we stated. Other districts, they don't have any volunteers. They're not allowing volunteers. Is that above and beyond? Certainly, but that's their choice. And ostensibly their board endorsed that. So I just need an endorsement or just to change. So we can move on. I'm fine with for now. I think it's vaccination for indoor events. And we can revisit this when the COVID numbers go down, which I pray will happen soon. I agree with that because um, for those who are unvaccinated, there is the live stream option. Kind of torn, but but I, I, I think I, I don't think requiring everyone to be tested is reasonable right now. I don't think we have the capacity. Yeah, honestly, I, I appreciate the thought because you're right. Our cases are vaccinated folks. Yep. Um, yeah. had five adults in the last month, and they've all been vaccinated. That said, it's good. yeah, the testing is getting better. We may get there with it. We may also get there better with. Uh, 
with the Pfizer uh, pill to treat COVID and we may all worry about it less. Maybe Omicron will turn out to be highly contagious, but not for the people in the hospital. There's a lot of ways this could evolve. Uh, so, so I'm not hearing uh, an overturning of what you want, what your your guidelines are at this point, but I am hearing a desire to we're going to need to keep revisiting. This. Yeah, it's, for example, like our, our our statement about 12 and up, like maybe it, we go down to five when everybody can, or maybe the community spread is slow. I mean, I just think we. I think this is through the winter, you know, we come back March 1st um, and see where we're at. I mean, we want to make it easy. This isn't about trying to, like I told the parent, we have, we were having events. There's a dance, we, there are things that have been happening and we're proud of that. And we don't want to make it so that people don't want to do it, but we also just have to have a few things in place so that we can jump in when we need to and uh, understand how, com how how time consuming the contact tracing is. Okay. Well, if we look at again roughly March first, that would be in time for a, a spring play and spring concerts. Mm -hmm. Okay. We ready to move on? Okay. Is there any more slides? Was that it for the slides? I forgot. I think that's. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That's that. How about that's okay. it? Okay. Yes, that was the last one. All right. Thank you all for your. Okay, um, moving on to the district calendar for the 2022-23 school year. Cynthia, there's still a hand raised. Um, Vandana has already commented. Okay. I thought that was a hand left up because she has already commented on this topic. No, I believe it was down, but okay. Okay, uh, moving on to the district calendar for 2022-23. So we, this was probably the most controversial topic last month um, around some of the special select days. So we're bringing this back with just the major holidays. We're getting, we get lots of calls that district people want to plan mm -hmm. um, and we need to start some stop dates. Um, we were collecting data on the select days about keeping it consistent and checking with office staff, but we asked that at least we do this part mm -hmm. so that we can get that out to the parents. So we do get a, at least one or two calls a week. And to clarify, the start of the year, the major holidays, and the end of the year are consistent with our high school district? Yes. Okay. Other comments or questions about this? I'm sorry? Is there any public comment about this calendar? No hands raised. Okay. Then may I have a motion? I move we approve the... 2022 2023 academic school year calendar. Thank you. A second. Okay. Thank you all in favor. All right. Okay. Got that taken care of. All right. I would suggest at this point that we take a um, brief break. Everyone will follow meeting back to order here um, and move along to our next item, which is the uh, The first interim budget report. Sorry, I, I drew the line at a weird spot. So we'll move on to the first interim budget report now. Okay, um, good evening. Uh, time of year to look at the first interim budget um, that needs to be um, reviewed and approved by the board prior to December 15th. So you can kind of see our reporting cycle here when we started with our adopted budget for July 1st. This is the first time that we've had to be able to make revisions to that budget. So we're here in December and you'll see the budget Adjustments are through December or through the end of November, November actually. And then, uh, but the actuals to date at the base bench are through October 31st. That's where we're at in our calendar. In January, we'll start getting to look at the governor's proposal for next year's state budget. So, um, Ken and I and Elizabeth are, are going to that next month and we'll be able to get more. Get more, too. Yeah. Oh, more is going the same, too. <laughs> I talked her into going. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so just some highlights. I'm not going to go through all of these things, but um, just some highlights with the state budget. There was a what they call the mega cola cost of living adjustment to the LCFF or local control funding formula, which is the how most school districts in the state of California are funded uh, based on attendance of kids in enrollment. And then there's also a special education received a 4.05% increase, which did affect us, which was a good thing. Um, special ed is notoriously underfunded, so. Any little extra that we can get is good, so that helped. 
Um, some of the state categorical programs received a, a very minor COLA, um, but we'll take it because they haven't gotten too much over the time of the um, last few years. And then there was a couple new things. Um, the governor had been deferring the apportionments that the state owes to districts during the year and pushing those off into increments throughout the year. Um, and so he's provided $11 billion to kind of eliminate one of the new year deferrals. So for us, it is a cash flow. We don't get a lot of money from state aid. However, it is a cash flow thing. So um, catching those up. And then the $1.8 billion for expanded learning time for K-6 and duplicated students, which was something that we looked at before. There's two different programs. There's expanded learning opportunity grant, which was a plan that we were presented and um, to be implemented. And then there's an expanded learning opportunity program, which I'll talk about a little later on a different slide. And then offering of independent study as an alternative form of education for kids this year, which we are doing. We have about 20 kids in that program right now. So, and we're starting to see some of those kids come back as their vaccinations are going through. So we expect that number to go down. I'm sorry, with the, the um, elementary device back here, it's hard to hear. I'm sorry, with that, we're down to 16 at the elementary. Right. And how many middle There was seven, I think it's with the county, it's still seven, I think. Well, one moved out of the district, so I think it's six. six. So we try to keep up, they're not in our system because they had to roll. So, um, also, there's a multi-year phase of universal TK, which we can talk a little bit about um, as well. And then planning for the universal free move program, as you know, we've mentioned a few times that right now, USDA, the federal government level, is giving an increased meal rate for this year so that we can provide free meals to every child. Um, and then next year, uh, the federal subsidy goes away for that, and the state wants to make up for that, but that will be a allocation that has to be passed by the legislature every year. There's no guarantee, so I did not build in that we're going to get that. Um, however, it is out there right now. And then we have a trailer bill with some additional funding that it really affects high schools and um, some concentration grant when you have high poverty rate schools that doesn't affect us. The kitchen infrastructure grant, a uh, minimum of $25,000 gives some money for equipment. That's kind of a one-time grant. We haven't seen it yet, but it's coming our way. Okay, and then the pre-kindergarten implementation we'll talk about. So new funds, what is in our budget now with First Interim, we have SR3, which Maura presented a plan on um, recently and how we're gonna spend those funds, so that was added. The Educator Effectiveness Grant was an old program that existed a few years ago. We had to provide professional development and compete for teacher and track that. That's come back to us and it's got a little bit more broad use. Um, so we've implemented that and we're trying to identify expenses for that as well. The expanded learning opportunity grant, we talked about that earlier. It's been split into two years this year instead of the state funding all of the portion. Um, some of it's going to be backfilled with federal dollars at the state level. So it got split into about five different programs from one program and caused an audit adjustment, an audit report. If you read through our assumptions that I included in the budget, I talked about an audit adjustment. It happens, so we will have that in our audit report this year. The audit report's been delayed for, usually it has to be approved by December 15th. It's been delayed to January 31st because the federal supplement still is not out for auditors to complete their audits. Ours is done. I have it in draft form. It does reflect that audit adjustment, and it's just shifting income from one year to the next. It's nothing that we did wrong. It was the way the state reclassified the grant at the last minute after everybody puts their books. The pre- um, Kindergarten planning grant. So this is about universal TK and giving schools some money to uh, implement uh, for facility use or teacher or training or curriculum. Or, there is no curriculum yet, but all of those steps you can do. We will be getting that. That's an early estimate of 111,310. I did not include it in the first term because it's not a sure number yet. And then uh, I want to wait until we get it just to make sure that it shows up this year. And that expanded learning opportunity program, which is different than the grant we did before, is to provide for after school care up to nine hours a day between school and um, after school care, which during the year is not an issue because our treehouse program fulfills that requirement. However, there's some issues with this around districts across the state and as well as in our county. Uh, we don't have a program for sixth grade. It's very expensive to add a program to sixth grade. We don't know that we would have a lot of participation for a very small dollar amount. 
an estimate right now is 67,000 a year that wouldn't begin to cover adding on that program. Um, there isn't a requirement that we have it at the middle school. However, we have enough transportation to get them to elementary if we did that. So a lot of districts are kind of saying, we're not going to implement it. The state has come back and said, and I'm just giving you a preview if we're not implementing this, that it will be not this year because they waived the requirements, but next year will be an audit finding and a return of the grant if you don't. So it will be an ongoing audit finding, but we just return the money that we don't spend. So not a big penalty. Property taxes, just the 13 year trend. I kind of give you a really long trend because property taxes over time can fluctuate greatly, especially for different periods of times of year. Our 13 year average is just over 5%, but the last couple of years, uh, or five, and the five year average is just under five. But the last couple of years have been a little lower. And I don't know if because with COVID, things kind of shut down, home sales kind of stopped for a while. You know, people didn't do a lot of things to their homes, kind of everything slowed down. So we're seeing an impact just a little bit. But the improper taxes for us are driven not only by increases in assessed valuations, but also by homeowners redoing things on their property, making changes to that, turning over homes. So I got itch my girls. And so just to look at our enrollment history, our enrollment number is up this year from what we showed at adopted budget, which is good. Um, and yet that's even with our kids in middle school at the county for independent sake. So that's a few more kids that are not currently reflected on our books that we hope will come back to. Um, so we're at 1596 now. You can see our enrollment decline over the last few years is about 23%, just shy of that. And kind of an average decline every year is 3.65%. So we're continuing that trend down. We recently got a uh, demographic study done. It continues to show that decline even with TK coming in. So we do, and I do project that in the out years so that we continue to decline, not by great amounts, slow down just a little bit, but we'll still see our higher grade levels going out and our younger grades come in and small. Next slide. So this is an interesting graph. Usually, I would usually show this, when, I'm, when I worked for an LCFF district, they're funded solely by the state and they get their property taxes on the act to cover in the state back. We're in a unique situation because we're a basic district. So you can see the blue line is the minimum state aid. If we took our attendance and we were a state funded district, that's a level of funding we would receive. So we'd be cutting our spending by one. Absolutely, it's a big gap. So you can see the trend over the years. When I say that last line of the yellow, the percentage of LCFF, you don't have a yellow line there. However, you can see a track that we used to be more state funded way back when our attendance was higher at 73%, we're tracking down as our enrollment declines. However, our property taxes are rising. So we're becoming more and more basic aid. There are some districts that are basic aid that ride the line. They flip between state aid and LCFF. We've got quite a bit of gap that we're well within the basic aid status and don't anticipate flipping to that um, program, which is a, a drastic change for districts. So just kind of a, Another look at how we are funding. Okay, next slide. So assumption changes since the adopted budget. You see a slight uptick in that enrollment, which is good. Our unduplicated students, which is our low-income students, our English learners, um, foster youth. We don't have any this year. We don't have any homeless as well. Um, the EL student population is up a little bit because assessments really couldn't take place due to COVID shutdown. So it's just a little bit higher this year. Um, but we anticipate that as those assessments are done at the end of this year, they'll probably um, go down a little bit. Property tax growth is sitting at 3.29% right now. And that's what the current rate is based on collections to date where we're headed and assessment values at the property uh, at the assessor's office right now. Property um, parcel tax revenues are still staying about the same, 475,000. We have a few more exemptions, but confident that 475 is a good number. The PERS and STRS, we had those rates when we did adopt the budget, so those were used. But the big differences were the unemployment rate. That one was greatly impacting school districts by jumping up to a half percent. The state came back and changed it. The school districts realizing that school districts weren't allowed to do layoffs 
So they reduced our rate to 0.05%. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but that was a big difference in our budget, a couple hundred thousand dollars. So, and then the workers' comp rate, we had anticipated it going up to 1.8 just because of COVID. We expected um, unemployment compensation because in some cases those were filed as workers' comp in the beginning. We expected it to be a little bit higher and it came a little bit lower. So we adjusted for that. Our FTEs are a little bit um, very slightly different. Um, certificated FTEs just by hours. There's just some hours of change between staff, so really no additional staff. And then the classified FTEs are up a little bit, and that's due to treehouse, special education, just shifting some other hours of state and making them coordinated as we get students. And then adding additional hours for the kitchen staff and an additional five hour position, which we have not been able to fill. It is budgeted, but we have not been able to fill that extra five hour position at this time. And then the management, the only reason that that went down is we reclassified a, a person in the superintendent's division from confidential to classified. So that never went down. And then step and column is the same. Contri general fund contributions to programs went down a little bit. This is where we supply unrestricted general fund dollars to restricted programs. Um, and it was for special education, routine restricted maintenance, a couple other small programs, SCF. The big change was special education. So we have a new SELPA MOU that provided, it used to be SELPA three that we're in of the five SELPAs in the county. We're site, we're getting funded at a higher rate than the other SELPAs. So we were sharing our revenue with the other SELPAs to equalize everything. Well, over the years, it shifted to where we were making less. We were getting giving them more and they were getting higher rates than we were getting. So it became very unfair. So our conversation over the last couple of years, worked on a new MOU with all of the SELPAs, went SELPA wide, superintendents voted on it, and it shifted the funding where we're actually getting about $270,000 more per year in special budget. And then next year, there's no cost sharing at all because everybody pays the same. So revenue update, giving you to just total general fund where we're sitting at. Property taxes, because that little bit of a decline in property tax rates that we've seen in the last couple of years, we're staying with the 3% in now years. And then you can see we're showing a slight decline in enrollment in ADA. Funded ADA, you're always funded on the prior year. Um, if it's higher, higher prior year current year, since we're declining, it's the prior year. And this is where you were talking about CSBA districts talking about this huge funding flip that they're going to have. Yep. So the state's been protecting and using um, 1920 ADA to protect everybody and said, we're going to fund you based on that. Now there's going to be this cliff where we're going to say, okay, you're going back to current or prior year. So now it's going to become a funding cliff for many districts. And fortunately, in this basic day, we're not going to get hit with that. So that's going to be uh, good for us. And then the unduplicated count is a only three-year average you can see the shift is so we have $34.7 million in general fund revenues right now. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'd like to show just the unrestricted revenue budget changes. The assumptions outline the total revenue change and kind of the differences. The executive summary goes into more detail so you can see that. But I kind of wanted to look at unrestricted revenue because this is where we can make an impact when we're either deficit spending or the things we can control. The restricted side of the budget, there's programs and grants that come in. You can only spend them a certain way. It does fluctuate greatly, as you've seen with all the COVID money that's come in. So that isn't really a place that we can do a lot of work with other than shift some unrestricted to there, which we did last year. So you can kind of see where we're spending our money this year. The big change in LCFF sources, as we've been talking about facility needs, and I've been reiterating that we've got some significant repairs to roofs that need to be done that we'll be looking at when we do our facilities workshop in January, that I was comfortable being able to shift three and a half million dollars from property taxes to deferred maintenance to start tackling some of those. And then if the board decides there's other priorities with that money, then that's great. If the board decides we don't want to transfer quite that much later, you tell me that's great. But I think the facilities workshop will show you that that need is there. And then the state revenue is just a slight change. Um, Nothing really big, it's literally lottery revenues. And then the local revenues are really site cash collections. They had revenues that rolled over from last year. We recognize this revenue now that we close the books. And then also some collections that they've done. And we've gotten some lease revenue, like the Chinese schools been able to come back and rent our facilities and LGSR 
did a few programs as well. So that's helped our revenues on the general fund side. Okay, next slide. Expenditure update. Um, you can see the projections going in the out years. I'm hoping because the state's in a pretty good financial position right now that they're gonna help us offset furs and stirs again, but there is no guarantee of that right now. And hopefully governor's budget in January starts to search and um, shift for us. But you can see those rates are increasing and that's the percentage it's increasing. So we have an additional 2.18% in STRS next year, and then it flattens out and it's going to become a cost of 19.1% for employees. And then the purge rate continues to increase. We're about 3% shy of where they want it to be. So they've been slowing that down a little bit. Health benefit increases. We did have um, like a 2.2 we talked about before with the new CIS program that we had a 2.83% increase in the rate. However, it's a little higher because by the time everybody actually selected the benefit plan that they went, wanted to go with, that it ended up being a 5.74%. And then step and column increases, we talked about that before. So total general funding expenditures this year is 38.35 million. So it is a little bit of deficit spending and we'll talk about that. And 80% of our expenses, even with all our transfers and things, um, it's about 8% of our costs. Right. I have a quick question. Sure. Maybe I'm not understanding. Um, come back to go back the, the unrestricted revenue budget changes. Okay. Uh, where does the number of the change operate from? Uh, yeah, the change between adopted budget and first general. It's mostly that 3.5 million deferred maintenance rate. Correct. That 3.9 million. And there's some noise also. But am I, am I misreading this? Isn't that? So the adopted budget, the LCFF sources that we showed we were going to have were 31 million, 617. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. First interim adjusted it downward to 28 million, 601, 468. Right. So the change was a negative, it was a decrease in the revenue. Right. I, I'm just, the, the, I, maybe I'm not looking at the math doesn't add up. Oh, the difference three. between 31,617 and 28,609, it's not 3.9 million. Sorry, I, I just noticed this now. Oh, maybe I didn't. I think the other changes are right. I think it's 2.9. Oh, yeah, because you go down to the oh. bottom, it's 2.9. Yeah. yeah. I, yep. Oh, I, I apologize. Yeah. It's <laughs> just, just a typo. Good catch. Yeah, that was a good eye. <laughs> I didn't catch. And I looked at this thing so many times and I didn't catch it. So, you know, it's kind of like when you do the when you set so up your first, presentation, you missed that. Set, you could, one of the things that just, I don't know, it just kind of doesn't make sense to me, but it's kind of a difference between the way I think of private company accounting and school district accounting is, so here we look at that as a decrease in revenue because we put money into deferred maintenance and it just doesn't actually, to me, revenue is the money that's coming in and then you parcel it out, whereas it's, it kind of gets taken out of the revenue bucket. It just never makes sense to me. So that's just yeah. It's a, one of the reasons I say school accounting feels a little crazy. There's a few. Well, there's two different ways. I followed the trend of what this district's always done for their different maintenance, which was an 80-91. And so eight thousands are revenues for the state option code. So there's there's twenty six digits, but this little four piece piece is classifies your revenues and expenses. So there's a revenue limit transfer and it's called 8091. And it's, you're basically taking what you get from your LCFF or property taxes, that calculation from the state aid, and then you're siphoning off and transferring it out to fund 14. In other districts I've been in, we've reclassified that. We've actually done it as a transfer out, like you do to fund 17 or fund the other funds. Here we follow the trend because our history here has always been that it's a revenue limit transfer, which is perfectly allowable. So it is kind of a negative revenue. So it does it does kind of complete that a little bit. So and because we have a big number of transferring out, it's very reflective here. Where it's usually four hundred thousand is what we typically does in the year. So it went up by three. Right? Yes, one of the other questions because I think this is great. It's like the actual LCFF sources revenue, not in the unrestricted revenue, but overall, like it's higher than that. 
So total LCFF sources. So we have a couple different things. This district is unique. So LCFF sources are traditionally unrestricted. So what it is, is it's the amount of money you get from the state based on your attendance, which is that LCFF calculation, and your property taxes. So um, those two pieces combined make up your state or LCFF. So we also have a restricted state aid that we get, but it's an excess property tax transfer from the SELPA. I don't know. We somehow get a piece of their property taxes that they siphon off and they give to us. So we're unique in that on the restricted site, there's that number. That number doesn't fluctuate greatly every time, but it has nothing to do with the actual LCFF population. I think yeah. what I was getting to was the 3.5 billion that is for great things. If we didn't do that, it would be higher than what our budget If we this didn't do that, then that 28 the million year. number would be three and a half million higher. Correct. Like well, it would be 3.9 million higher because we're transferring. We already had an adopted budget $400,000 transfer for maintenance out of that. I added another three and a half million. So it's at 3.9. I think that's why I have the 3.9 there. Oh, okay. This is the number. I, I Correct. So our total deferred maintenance transfer is 3.9 million. So we can pull out $400,000 for maintenance. Yep. Okay. We've been doing that for years. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, on the restricted side, you see how I have that kind of second to last line it says transfers out. We could have reflected the 2014 transfer there as well, but it's just traditional. So you can see not a lot of fluctuation in salaries and classified salaries. Some of it was we have vacancies, we built them. Um, some of people uh, stepped or moved the column between the teacher salary schedule. So we have some slight changes, a few hour changes. So just a kind of minor change in those, plus those include substitute costs. So which we didn't have a lot of last year and we have a little bit this year. So um, so those fluctuate as we see our use. Set. So we'll usually judge uh, our substitute costs based on all training. So um, we're, and we've had a hard time doing sets. So just to put that out there. And I, it's the same problem everywhere. And then um, employee benefits, the reason it decreased mostly because workers' costs went down. And so that even though our health and welfare costs went slightly up for election, that workers' comp rate and unemployment rate going down helped offset that bring those numbers down. Books and supplies just a little bit higher. Um, we purchased some science materials, IXL learning, we need the math, um, the con uh, services and operating. We implemented some contracted services for SEL. And then we didn't have an independent study contract when we did adopt a budget because we developed that before we knew we were, how we were going to operate for the year. So that's in there. And then we added some additional nursing services for RO help, for row help, that I'm hoping will help with the with the COVID treat, uh, COVID testing with Christina and HR, helping them. But I don't think that they put that in place yet. I think they're requesting that. And I think row help is even short step now nurses as well, but that is a better budget. And then just some utility increases, pg and &E increased quite a bit this year. So as always, um, so they always come back a little higher than we anticipated them coming back. Um, and some of the other rates have just increased. And then the transfer requirement increased to 17 based on our board policy, it's board policy 3100 and um, like that transfer for after we close the books. We had quite a significant increase to turn to 17. So it is a part of our reserves. However, it's showing this expenditure. And then just the decrease in contributions for special ed. We talked about that with the self-contract. Okay. Next slide. The, oh, sorry, this, this includes the salaries um, in the raises. Correct. This includes, yeah, because we had that set up before we started the year. Yeah, it was nice. Okay. So components of the ending fund balance, um, you know, the highlights here are just that assigned reserves that we've always had, maintenance and other projects. Um, we have a $300,000 set aside for that, $250,000 for technology replacements as we've gone, even though we did purchase a lot of technology over COVID and trying to send that out, just constant replacements of Chromebooks and different things happening and occur. 
So just in case that we don't have enough budget, it would be able to serve to get that forth from. And then KE textbook adoptions, um, we have a science, some science materials are being done now. They're doing some EL, ELA pilot work. So we're gonna anticipate that we have an ELA pilot adoption coming. And then there's other um, curriculum along the way that Lauren and her teams are exploring and, and will be implemented over the next couple of years. So we have a million dollars set aside for that. The supplemental early retirement program, we still have three years of payments of that to make. So um, that's getting wound down. And then the learning loss and summer program. So classic example, we thought maybe summer would cost $150,000 to run with the Jumpstart program in summer school. I could have picked summer school on his wife and ended up costing about $270,000. So kind of more than the grant that we had. So we anticipate needing those extra funds. And just as we do all the data and all of that, finding what those kids and services need, we have additional state funds to help with summer this next year. But beyond that, it's gone. So it would have to come from general funds. So if we still have some learning loss and things that we need to do and more summer programs, we need to have some set aside for that as well. So you can see our and does it, um, our economic uncertainty, the 3% state requires of general fund expenditures set aside, and the unappropriated is the balance left over that's not accounted for in any other project. But I just keep in mind that ending balance is one time money. Everybody goes, you have great, you know, maybe you have 19% in your reserves, it's one time. It's a savings account. Take so spend it out of there, it's gone. You gotta, you know, cut two dollars to put the money back. So just keep that. Next slide. So multi-year projections, giving you a look at the updates for those. You can kind of see our beginning balances. Our revenues are tracking upwards. Um, 22-23 does include a 3% raise for all bargaining units, but the third year does not. All it has is seven months. So we do not have any negotiation settlement for 23-24 as far as salary compensation is considered. And then the expenditures out. Um, we did, I did continue the trend of increasing the deferred maintenance transfer uh, from 400,000 a year to a million a year. And you'll see why when I do that. Facilities workshop, but we're gonna need to really set aside some money to tap things because we don't have any other funding to do it with other than our general fund. We'll talk about it at that time. So you can see that, sur that surplus deficit spending. We're now deficit spending in all three years, largely because we're transferring that larger portion over to deferred maintenance, but we also have an issue with SEF too. So we fund a lot of programs with SEF. They've been um, not being able to raise as much money as they normally do. It's still tough for them to raise the money by the programs that they are currently covering. So we've had discussions with them multiple times. They're working on a plan, trying to decide what they can fund so that we can look at the programs that they decide they cannot fund anymore to see if it's something the board wants to continue to do. Um, I do have a contribution in here of about $250,000 a year. So, and I'm not gonna take that out until we decide if we're keeping these programs or not. So that will probably be a decision that we'll reach in communication. Gene, do you anticipate any problem with the county feeling good about this and for showing deficit spending all three years? Um, yeah, they still will look at our reserves. Um, they'll still, they may ask us, why are we going to spend any time trying to tackle that? I want to talk about, you know, a million dollars is just to deferred maintenance. Um, and I did put that in my assumptions that we, if we showed that number, that that's kind of one time expenses that we're transferring over there would still meet our reserve requirement by a lot. I think what they're trying to do is make sure that we're not dipping at that 3% and we're not in trouble. And it's something fixable, right? So um, because we're spending one time dollars in there, it's explained. So if, they, if we were given a salary increase and it did this, then they would have a problem with this. So they really want to keep you out of that deficit spending territory. But I want to make you aware, you know, these numbers change all the time. We know that we always say these are projections. It's absolutely projections. It's um, exactly, you know, it's, what do we say? It's um, estimated correctly, but exactly wrong, you know? <laughs> That kind of methodology, like we never have it perfect. So, but we do our best to be not only conservative, but build good projections and build in what we know so that we're covered. We don't want any surprises. Okay, next slide. So, just to look at our other funds, you can see the new one on the top, Fund 8, Student Body Funds. We kind of put that last year when we closed our books. Um, there's a new gathering requirement that 
requires us to now recognize uh, the ASPs, the Associated Student Bodies of all of our schools, and put them on our books. So I got their most recent quarterly activity through October, and their activities, you can see how many is there. Most of that money is a red one. Um, obviously, because it's just a bigger ASP, you know, the trees have very small ASPs. Cafeteria fund is still holding their own. Um, their expenditures are still a little bit higher than their revenues projected right now, but not significant. So, um, and some of that's just, you know, the cost increase of uh, giving a raise and you know, employee benefits, and then just a little bit, the participation is going up. So I think that will track a little bit higher about how we get second in room. So we'll see how that goes. Deferred maintenance, you can see that that number has increased greatly from the beginning balance. So we have that set aside. And then the fund 17, which is that basically reserve fund, which we do calculate the percentage that we show you or reserve percentage. Uh, that's included in there and that had a $1.4 million transfer based on our closures last year because we had quite a bit of fallout and it was because we got all the COVID funds. So that really caused a one-time kind of fallout in our job. And then OPEG, there's nothing else really exciting in here. The building fund has a little bit of money in there. That's really from the property sale of Congress Springs. So that's, you know, I had to dig out records of that. Um, found some interesting things about how that came about and what the kind of plan was at that time. And as we look at facilities, that'll be another discussion, I guess, for you guys to, you know, look at that money because it's pretty unrestricted and really up to the board on how they want to spend it. It is for capacity to spend on facility, but it doesn't have to be new facilities. So it is another avenue to tap. And then capital facilities fund, that's the very restricted development fee fund. So the majority of those funds can only be spent for new construction and to increase enrollment capacity. So it's very limited. So those monies are pretty much cash flow for us. So, and then the bond interest reduction, the OPO bond. Not like a track at Redwood either. What's that? Could be used for like a track at Redwood. We could probably get away with it being, um, because you, it's not only enrollment capacity, but it's also new programs. So like if we had an enrollment capacity for special ed, Special ed numbers went up and we needed another, say, a portable to house a monster bus that we could spend the money to do that to expanding the program. If we expand the track and do something to expand programs that do more for kids, you know, yeah, like that would actually be a conversation. Yeah. So, um, Fund 51 is the old general obligation bonds the district has. Those were paid off in 2028. So, that's um, Use for our community, so that's coming up. It'll come up quicker than we think. And then the fun after school child care fund that's tree house, so you can see that they grow as well. We gave them quite a bit of a contribution last year to shore them up because they had the staffing. We still had to maintain all the same staffing that we didn't have a program for most of the year. So, and our learning pods, first. And our learning, but they did, it they did so they did, they did, so they yeah. did a lot of work. So, I need K six. The yes. Okay. Yeah. That's six grades. So. Okay. Next slide. Um. That's it. Actually. So I'm sure you have other questions or thoughts or concerns or, you know, things we can think about going forward. I know January is going to be. I got my facility slides ready to go, so Ken's going to start diving into those and see what else he thinks and adds to that. So he's ready. Okay. I'll just say if there's anybody in our um, viewing public that's going to want to make a comment about this, go ahead and get that uh, raised hand feature up. My, my one question is the ongoing deficit spending. What, what's the recommendation to fix it? Yeah, fix it. Okay. So right now, I'm showing it as a limited term deficit spending. Um, partially because SEF, we've got to solve the SEF problem. If they're not able to fundraise at that level, then we're going to need to look at their programs. And then that would be a poor decision on how we want to fund us. Do we want to continue to use reserves or what? 500,000. So typically they fundraise a year in advance. So the money they raised last year is the money we're going to get this year. Because they're supposed to raise the money before we do the programs, and then they give it to us kind of in January. -ish. So we, they're planning on setting that our way. So they'll present something to the board and provide those funds. 
This year, I think they're still under 500,000 current. So, um, but they're, they're still trying to go out there and promote to try to get additional. But their programs run about 750,000. Last year, we were able to help them with some of the COVID funds. We, were, we kind of reallocated some of the staff to other duties that we could be done with COVID funds um, to try to shore up some of the learning, and learning loss that kids were having. Um, so we were able to help offset some of their programs and give them a little more carryover to work with this year. But going forward, those, you know, our staff only get more expensive and unfortunately they fund a lot of staff. Um, so we really need to take a look at their programs and maybe they should be funding other things that are not things that consistently go up in price set. So um, we need to work with them. The other thing is just different maintenance, with, right? Increase the transfer to different maintenance. So I increased it 600,000. So that's half of that debt. So that puts us the Yeah, that and SEF is a big chunk of it. But the problem exactly. being though that that third year out, you don't have any raises for staff. Right. So it, it, the number is understated. I mean, as we continue to decline, we lose staff to attrition, things like that. So we're not going to replace them, right? I assume flat staffing. Um, we did talk a little bit about TK. So I do anticipate at least two staff probably retiring next year. I left the FTEs alone going out because we're going to have to add for TK, right? So I just kind of left it flat more conservatively. As we lose staff, it depends on where we lose them. So as to whether we have the back going. So I would rather leave the staff flat. I didn't build in any additional staff because of our decline, but that would be another place that we probably have to look back because that's 80% of our budget. Right? I can't cut utilities as much as I'd like to. Yes, we did talk about you know things. We have a solar analysis that will be part of the presentation in January. However, I think you'll see, you'll see that presentation and then you can make some thoughts and suggestions fine. So Although utilities don't take a huge chunk of our budget, so just a normal cost of business of things that we have to do. Um, insurance is another 200000 a year. So as much as we had, you know, our flood at Redwood Middle School that took out four of our classrooms, the actual cost that came in there, 100000 is us, the rest will be covered by insurance. The cost estimate is $203,000. So when I say maintenance and other repairs, we'll set aside 300 in the reserves. This is why these things come up and happen. And we need a place that we have some money protected when these things occur. So hopefully very rarely, you know, but that's what's gonna happen. So Melissa Phyllis, questions? Okay, uh, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, Grace, am I seeing that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so at this point, what we need to do is to actually uh, approve the first interim budget report and so that you can send it off to the county folks. Is this a roll call? No, the next one is. Okay. All right, uh, may I have a motion? We approve the interim, on the front page, the first interim budget report. Thank you, a second? Second. Thank you, all in favor? Aye. All right. Take the way. And then moving on to this resolution regarding the annual accounting of developer fees. Can I give some quick explanation on that? Yes. So um, as we collect developer fees every year, we're required to report how much revenue we took in, if we had expenditures, and how we spent those funds. So annually, we provide you a summary of the year before. So um, I believe it's calendar year. I didn't pull it up for me. Calendar year. So um, this is for the 2020 year. Um, so you can see that we typically only spend for doing our developer fee report. And then I think we had another piece in there. And I apologize. You guys didn't load that, did you, Grace? If you didn't, it's fine. No, it's loaded. Harry's pulling it up right now. Just for, um, I'll, I'll talk about that one, just pulling that up. So when 
we look at the development street summary. Sure. We collect developer fees for the high school district as well. So we take in all of the fees and quarterly we pass their portion on. So we actually get a very small portion of that, but they allow us to keep the interest part of that money. So that's been helpful for us. Um, so that gives us a little bit more money set aside and then the interest that's earned on that. And the administrative cost is a portion of our accountant's salary for doing all of this work. She does all the permits, all the collections, all the reporting. Um, so a portion of her salary is charged over there. And that contracted services for the company that report that we're required to do. Um, so we really didn't spend the money on anything else. So you can kind of see what those totals are at that $3.47 million set aside. So we have to do a resolution to pass that we presented this report by the end calendar year, um, certifying the data. Developer fee. So this is when somebody does an addition or some renovation to their home, or you go and use the permits that you go and there's a fee. So if you do over 500 square feet, then there's a developer fee that comes to the district. Um, this is also the condos that were built in uh, Mount Serena. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that has generated it. quite a bit of development for us over the last year. Okay. So that's where a large portion is. How about some commercial buildings? Commercial buildings. Um, commercial buildings uh, have a different rate, but yes, there is a commercial spread. We don't see that very often. There's not a lot of commercial buildings here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because every time everyone, anyone tries, they get shot. They don't get shot. Yeah. I did hear um, my husband's company, one of the owners of their company, um, from Morgan Hill lives in Saratoga and he says his house is like from the 1800s and he goes to do anything to it is like a massive headache. You can't do anything to the house. So um, it's very restrictive on stories and, and square footage and all kinds of stuff because you've never seen something so long. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I don't I don't see any raised hands on, on this one uh, in terms of public comment. Give me no no. Okay. Yeah, I, I just have a quick question. Sure. Um, our last time I think the facility was through, and we talked about the development fee. And the, so, if I remember, you mentioned that you know there might be some exception or new policy on how to use those funds. So, like, can you talk about that? Just yes, I can. Yeah. So, um, when somebody comes in here, developer fee, go through the process the same. Developer fees are typically restricted for new construction for our district, but and to increase capacity for our moment, but we have a history of declining for more than 10 years. Um, and we uh, have needs that are outside of new construction. So we need to fix the roof or fix the HVAC or we need to do some repairs to our school. So if you there's a waiver process that each person can sign off on a waiver that says you can use these monies to maintain the public schools rather than the construction. Uh, so we do have that and we have it separated in that public facilities fund. Right now it's about $179,000. I would put that in just a few years ago. It's a very small portion. Um, some people are glad to do that. They understand it. Some people are a little confused by what that means because it's they don't understand how their money and schools work. So they choose not to sign the waiver. And that's fine. That's totally their option. Uh, but that is presented to them for everybody to get to. Okay. So when you mentioned about the separate accounts, so those money can go to our general fund or still have to stay still has for to the for facilities, okay. but we can use it for repairs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um at this point, could I get a motion uh, regarding approval of this resolution? Sure, I can make a motion for resolution 503.12.21. Thank you, and a second. Yeah, second. Okay, and uh, we need a roll call, Grace. Sure, Scott Adler. Aye. Cynthia Miller. Aye. Phil, I mean, sorry, Melissa Stannis. Aye. Phyllis Tong. Thank you very much. Moving on to a second reading for the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant. So this is the block grant that is um, for a value of about $427,000 could be spent over a period of four to five years. Um, items that we talk. Um, sorry, you just need something to read it. That's my screen. 
Um, so items that we talked about covering with this would be covering the 50% uh, teacher on special assignment this year, a uh, special uh, TOSA for reading next year if we have the reading adoption, um, covering our SEL uh, coach, Wendy Barrett, and then also covering portion of the class of Cassie Nelson this year. Question for comments on this? Any public comment? Get those little hands raised. Don't see anything there. So I um, have a motion. I move that we approve the educator effectiveness blueprint. And a second. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. All right. Moving on. Okay. At this point, we'll look at the board governance handbook. Uh, you may recall that uh, Melissa kindly volunteered to go away and uh, incorporate the uh, um, district goals for this year into this and to take a general look at the uh, governance handbook. Um, she did go back and forth with me a couple times on that. Uh, we don't necessarily need to get through the entire thing tonight, but it would be nice to take a look at least at maybe the first bit of it. This is basically our agreement for how we, we work. Um, so this is the time to say, you know what? I, I, I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't want to work that way. Would it be helpful for me to sort of run through overview of what has changed? Yes, please. OK. Um, so overall, minor formatting changes that do not affect contents. Um, we replaced the guiding principles for reopening and running schools in your total with our stated priorities for the 2021 2022 school year. Uh, added item number six under the board responsibilities, uh, which was maintaining financial oversight and allocating resources and ensuring that three dollars were spent wisely. We uh, I revised the visiting schools. Individual board member. Oh, we may need to slow down just a little bit. Sorry, it's page number when you look at it. I, page number hasn't changed. So, okay. um, page 10. Thank you. Page 10. So, revised visiting schools um, to be in line with our expected practice. I revised individual board member requests for information, which is on the next page, page 11. Again, be in line with our current practice and individual board member requests for action. For information and for action. So those two are uh, next to each other again to be in line with our current practice. There was a section on Friday messages which was to be deleted in a control. That's still in here. Okay. Uh, that. Um, and then there was some reporting, but yeah, it is still in here starting on page 20. One, since that's no longer being done, we recommend that we keep that. Uh, re general rewarding um, for a better flow about special meetings and study sessions. So the information is, is consistent, but it's been reordered and reorganized. Um, and the special board meeting requests, something that was approved by this board. Uh, 20, it was 2020, uh, over the summer. Yeah, perhaps. before you two came on, yeah. on, but it never had made the governance handbook. So this is a copy and paste of what was approved by the board. And then questions to ask um, on page 22. Uh, both members, do we want to include board members? Do we want to include district board members for each of the board members? Uh, I would prefer not to publish my personal phone number there. Okay. The bill has all been removed from this document. That's me. And as we go down for the information that's in here, the certificated and classified uh, staffing breakdown that begins on page 25. This is something that has to be updated uh, continually. Is it useful to have it here? Should we find another way to explain this information? Um, it is available elsewhere. It's, this is our source for it. 
that's a question you can ask the board. Um, updated, I drove down to try and find it. Okay, so why don't we try and kind of resolve that? So, starting at page 25, there's a fairly detailed amount of information about staff and FTE and where they are, what, what level of information do we want in this document. This doesn't make sense to me. I think we should remove the, the numbers of the staff and everything. Okay. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Is there any reason that we want to list the fact that it's the detail in the past? It's like, oh, we just know I've ever questioned this. You know, I it's been in here as long as I've been on the board. I think. It, it's often some of this is put in because then it's easy thing for the superintendent to throw at a new board member and say, oh. and all the all the details you're supposed to know are in here somewhere. That requires a lot of I just feel like it's always going to be scale or behind. Yeah, so just it's, yeah. yeah. If there's, I I actually recommend you put some information up where you can find this. Sure. Oh, so yes. Yes. Where to yeah. find. Like, you know, we, we can list some of these things about community serve and then for more detailed information. Go to. We have links to the SARS so that are so often in the FTE. Yeah, the budget always idea. includes FTE. What's that? The budget always includes in FTE. Budget. So we can have those as on a, <laughs> these links on the digital version. Because my, my personal feeling is like those links are way more valuable. Yeah. And more likely to be a <laughs> I, I don't actually know where they are from. So great to have a list of that's a good way to do it. So pages 22 to 28 looks like could, could fit in that category. Like all kind of online resources in the current. Great. Okay. Can do that. Um, oh. are we are we taking out the Friday messages? That, let's come back to that. Oh, sorry. I, okay. I just have to go into that. I'm sorry. I just kind of running through it all. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so 22 to 28, we just decided on. Okay. Come back to the Friday message. So we could we could go one of two ways on that. So Friday messages we came up with, oh, I don't know, about seven years ago now, when communication was a big issue, uh, perceived issue. I would say in the district. Um, and we were doing it, but the way it was working was we have a meeting on Thursday night, and it was the following week we would get out the Friday message. The part that's hard is whoever writes that message, then of course has to be careful under the Brown Act. So it basically, was a the board met on last Thursday and discussed the following items. We approved the first interim budget. Uh, we uh, reviewed the governance handbook and got an update from the superintendent about MTSS and COVID, and that's what it would, would say. Then we got into, when COVID hit, we got into an issue where by the time you could get that out eight days later, <laughs> a, lot was, a lot of change. And so we kept running into this, like, no, can't put that out because then you really hopelessly confuse people so it fell by the wayside. We could, I think, do a couple of different things. One would be to say, we can just take it out. Another would be to say, we want to leave it in because we'd like to go back to practice, but we know that for now we just aren't doing it. Or we could say we need to change it in some way. Thoughts? Or we can say for now we just want to take it back. What's I mean, well, I think a year from now, people will like maybe you know, what we this it seems like we sent from my office and Prince were sending a lot. And so maybe I think messages are getting lost in, in the in inboxes. So maybe when it's kind of post pandemic, that makes make more sense. Can we feel it from missing something right now? Like the way it is now. Uh, I think right now we're sitting at lots of yeah, I think yeah, a lot. 
And at the time, there was a little bit of a concern that the board wasn't communicating to the community. And I think right now we're we're kind of feeling like the communication is more from the principal and superintendent, and we're less worried about us doing the communication. I wonder. Right. I wonder if it's because you know before the board meetings went, you know, on Zoom. Yeah, that would also true. Yep. Just listen to it right now. You can kind of go back and see what happened to the board communication that happened. You talked about their office hours, you know, all those things. So maybe it's just a, maybe you change into something like more of a general communication for your kind of goal is around communication rather than specific right now. Okay, what if we just flag this? What if we left it in? In here, but we put a flag on it temporarily on hold or something like that. And, and then just agree, we'll come back and get it. Maybe the song. Thanks. Uh, what else did Melissa be running by there? So, okay, addition of item number six and the board responsibilities. Oh, yes. It's on page seven. So it's an addition of maintaining financial oversight and allocating resources and ensure that taxpayer dollars are spent wisely. Primary responsibility. Okay, so let's begin with that. Yeah. Okay, put that one in. Uh, and then I think there was a page, uh, page 10, visiting schools, starts with visits are encouraged and will be arranged by the district office throughout the year. So this would be visits of board members to schools. The previous 40 was the thing you could come in. Just make sure you see how this will be. It was just very, it was a hard part. Practice. Okay. You, you may want to say we just said, yeah, this is trustees. This is by trustees. Yeah. Okay, that's a good idea. Um, is that enough of talking about this for tonight? And you think about it and maybe we'll just put it on the agenda next time to see if there's been any further thoughts. There's one last thing we'll get to, which is minor. Um, I updated the stipend information for current practice. That's at the very bottom of the last page. Yep. Page 30, it said board members receive 2000 a year, and that's not current practice. We get a free and board payment. Your variable payment. Yeah, this is mixed um, And um, I mean, the board members can buy in the district health insurance policy. We talked this, so they came up at CSBA and said, Now that, that's a we, we buy it, we, we do not qualify for health benefits courtesy of the district. Are there any public comments on this? Nope, I don't see any. Okay, right. I, I just have a question that I don't know how you guys will when you read the district mission statement and also the our vision statement. Um, that that's been there for yeah, I know a long time. Yeah, for a long time. And so when I read those statements, you know, I saw a lot of big words, mm -hmm. but I don't feel that it said the tone is telling the community what our core values are and what we stand for. It's I think it's not clear. We are telling them what we are doing, but it's not clear to them. It's a vision, our vision, and so so. Then I went through. I you know, I I just you know go to the internet to Google to see you know how the other school district do their vision or the mission statement. So I found the one that you know I learned about this school district. Well, I went to the CSBA and I really like their program, and so I. I want to read it out to you guys, so maybe you can get sense that what I'm saying. So the mission of the, you know, the XXX school district, the leading expert in human learnings is to ensure all students 
cradle to career, develop their knowledge, skills, and the proficiencies required for college, career, civic, and civic success by inspiring and engaging them in a system uh, distinguished by uh, number one, the high expectation for student and the staff performance, two, vital partnerships with um, families, community, and the employer. And the number three, uh, culturally proficient, proficient, proficient school. And the number four, learning experience beyond traditional boundaries of where and when. Number five, safe, respectful, and a welcoming environment. And uh, I just feel that, you know, from those statements telling us what kind of school district we are and what we stand for, and uh, I feel the mission statement is very important that should be everyone in this school district, you know, the parents, community members, still, even students understand, you know, what the mission and the, what the vision of our school district. But by looking at what we have right now, it's, I know a lot of big words there and a lot of things we want to accomplish, but it's hard for people to see that a lot of times, teacher will ask us like, what's our goals? What's our vision? And uh, then I told them our vision is not clear. But when you look at the vision, our mission statement, it's, I don't know, it's up here, up there, but, and the old- You wanna uh, translate it into something yes. more concrete? Uh -huh. Yeah, something like that. No, I'm not saying that we should change our mission statement, but maybe we can just, um, how to say, just make it practical, so, uh, or work the ball. Let uh, me see if I'm, I'm yes. following. So we, we, have this, we could have the same district mission statement, but then yes. have a, another little bit that says what this means more specifically is, and then have some specifics. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, because I think, you know, yeah, I mean, when I look at those statements, I know, I know it's good and uh, they're kind of high level. Yeah, but it's a very high level. And for someone who really want to, I mean, for example, develop some programs or some. Um, it's hard really to see that, you know, the goal is here. And so how I, for example, I really like one of the statements is the safe, respectful and welcoming environment. That's something we want to have, right? And it's a learning experience beyond traditional boundaries of where and when is creativity, right? And uh, all the innovation. It's just like something people can easily think that, you know, okay, I can apply the, daily teaching or, you know, the principal can apply those um, mm -hmm. principles in the school, something like that. That's just, so, I thought, um, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, would, would you and Phyllis be able to work together on something that might fit in there to address what she's talking about? Yeah, so hopefully, we can Can we transfer those big words to something? We think it's workable. Thanks. Okay. Maybe the two of you work on that, then uh, maybe maybe in time for our next meeting. Yeah. If, if it's not doable by then, you can just need to say so. Yeah. Okay. So, we can start next year. Mid January. Mid January. It's next year. It's next year. <laughs> but if you need to say yeah, it's going to be February. Then you need to come back and say that. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't see any raised hands on this. Can we move on? Okay. Uh, next one we have up here is a discussion of the board meeting format for 2022. I, I would um, maybe slightly change that because I don't know at this point we want to necessarily try and figure it out for the whole year. But at what point do we want to um, uh, look at any changes in this this format? And in particular, um, and what? We've told we told that. Oh, I'm sorry. Resolved. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. So um, there, I think the the 
There's a range of things we can do here. Right now, we are in person, we are zooming out. Um, we don't right now allow anyone else in the room. So at what point do we want to allow other people in the room? We are starting to bring some of our presenters back to person. Um, and do we want to continue? There's the zooming out and then there's taking comment via Zoom. So all of those things and how, you know, what do we want to continue for now? When, when do we maybe want to make a change in some dimension? I have a logistics question. Mm -hmm. If we be in person, if we have in person comments and we do the same thing we said before, which is you have to be vaccinated, oh, that we have to have yeah. a conversation for people who are not vaccinated. Um, to the high school, after any applicants and parents show the vaccine, okay. I don't think they do. They, they do for their shows. <laughs> yeah, I can't explain. I don't think they do. I'm, I'm just wondering logistically. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm good not question. saying one way or the other. Well, another logistical is um, so we look at this room and our where. Some, somewhere over there, um, but that doesn't look like there would anybody could sit over there very easily and look this way. So, so for example, at our at what I'm proposing for our board workshop is just on facilities. Um, I'd like to not have my tech team have to come on a weekend, and we typically don't have a lot of participation for board workshops. So I'd like to try to do that one in person. If people want to make a comment about board workshop facilities, to do so. Um, but that way, it gives us our first chance to try it in person. We typically don't record or Zoom or we don't record our workshops. Um, that's typically how that works. So I would like to try that so we don't have to drag Harry and Grace in on a Saturday for that. But our workshop is four hours. The facility like, workshop yeah. is four hours. It's one to four. So it's three, three hours. hours. Oh, three hours. Oh, okay. One to three hours. Okay. So I, I know we don't have nearly as many people on Zoom as we used to. I think right now, though, the public appreciates that we Zoom out. Um, I, I, I would be reluctant to stop that. I think, I think this is the Friday. Today is a Friday. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's like the other one. We but even then, the, the numbers have, have, have worked down. So I would be reluctant to stop Zooming out. I think people really appreciate it. Having them recorded and zooming out and having recorded for later. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's your. I think that's you know the the extra staff required is when we pull people in from Pat. You know, we could probably have less staff to do it, but we but the pulling people in and out gets to be there's that takes an extra person to do that. Not having experience with board meeting other than <laughs> COVID. Um, for those who did experience pre-COVID board meetings, what are we missing from, from that experience? Um, we're definitely getting less uh, participation from our employee groups. Uh, uh, typically, they would make some comment during employee comments portion. It was often, um, just want to let you know that there's the, um, what's that March event we do, um, the student, um, Student, 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 student conference. Student, student conference. I want to make sure you all know the student, student conference, and here's when you can come. Or um, uh, we did the spotlights. Yes. Yeah, spot. You know, show, showcase something. Right. Spot, missing spotlights. Now to do spotlights, then we have to be asking a lot of kids to come. Yeah. yeah. Is that like when like the Girl Scouts would come show something? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Think of when voters came to present. Um, we'd absolutely, I mean, I would recommend we use this multi for the workshop. We do that in person. We, you know, she's using the, the multi purpose room here, and it's plenty big for if guests wanted to come in. I think that's. I, I feel like in this format, we're isolated from our community. Um, and I, I, I'm wondering if in the previous format, if you had more of that connection, more of that involvement. Well, it's, it's just different personally when. You know, you, you see somebody sitting there versus, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a list of names here. Mm -hmm. um, so I think not letting people come in does make it a little bit different. Well, um, this, this was such a huge step up just us doing this. I yeah. mean, it felt like, you know, sitting and 
the bedroom at home during COVID, trying, you know, that was terrible. So I think this is, and I think the next evolution of that is just getting folks back in. Um, but, but then Scott's point of, so. Yeah, we'll have to look into There's some, I, we don't have an answer. We can't, I can't decide tonight, but I'll look into those. That's a good point. Here. There is a, a personnel. It's sort of like when people went back in person to the classroom, there is some humanity that comes yes. back to like looking at yeah. you. I see you, you, some of the most valuable parts are the small talk or the laughing, you know, or the, there, there is definitely a closer feeling when people are here in person, the same way when kids are back in person or, yeah. I appreciate that the two of you are here in person. I mean, I know it's a whole lot more convenient for you <laughs> to be from home, yeah, and but particularly it is nice as it gets late. Person. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I feel that way for That's many tough. aspects. There are lovely things about Zoom when, like, it involves traveling, you know, to the county office or something and back. But when you're trying to build relationships, I think there's something valuable about that being in person. I, I do see the value absolutely in being able to broadcast your meetings out. Um, but I feel like, again, we're sort of up here and then the audience is here and we're not getting that level of interaction that it sounds like existed before COVID. So, so, so what if we try the board workshop on uh, whatever day that is? It's 20 something or other. Um, we do the board workshop uh, as a, an in person. We're going to figure out how we do that in person. Um, but we, we invite the, the community can attend um, but, because, as you point out, we typically don't get no, many people. So give us an opportunity to, to try try see. that and see how it goes. Give you an opportunity to do the investigating, opportunity to try that. Um, but to your point, uh, I think on an ongoing basis, we need to keep zooming out. But the staff issue of that being a Saturday and it not being something that would have a huge amount of interest would be would we be okay not zooming out the facilities um, question. We have a board meeting two days before that. So. Yeah. So that one I think we just do status quo because I don't have answers to questions you pose which are you think can that we record it and make it available later for people to see? Just required again to get the zoom. So I don't know if I could manage to do it without bringing dragging in more staff. Oh, got it. I just thinking we could do the old school. We have the recorder. That's how we used to do it. Post them. Everybody had yeah. Voice so recording. we could definitely do the audio. I can push that button. I'm certain I can do that. <laughs> and we could make the presentation available. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, post so it. Nice. I, I think there are some significant things that I think our community understands that we're going to be spending money on, and I think they're not small dollar things. So, right. but if I we're if we're not taking public important. comment over Zoom. And doing that, then we have to let the community in to be, to be able to make public comment. Okay, so we are now going to do out for the workshop, right? Right. We'll but, do the in-person. But yeah. for, the, not for the other meetings, but we'll we'll continue zooming out. We'll just sample this, just okay. try the in-person part, and then I don't have to okay. staff it on. Yeah. Oh, so it's not like a high school school, you do not have in-person, no. It's just in this would be in person, but then, not okay. for the regular meetings. We have to figure yeah. out some of the Then we have to make it very clear to the community. That's the only one. That's an exception. Yeah, that's an exception. Well, so you're saying you want to try to learn from that, but that we're talking about doing that differently, anyways. Like, are we just saying, like, like let's say we didn't have the facility workshop? Then we're, we're saying we need to research more. Yeah. But I think I think we're all feeling I, I think I'm I'm seeing heads nodding that the zooming out needs to stay for me. Yeah, that's what we're right. And and I would I would like to have as many presenters in person. I think would be good. I would love to get back to the spotlights, but I don't think we're that that's a we'll good thing there. to do yet. Yeah. Get to the point where we don't all have to be in front of the Zoom screen, like where we can actually be interacting, and yeah, we can just use one of these to broadcast out. And I think the what I'm understanding, um, Grace has shared a little bit. Uh, at the high school, there's a couple of Zoom bars, and they don't do this. It's just they're watching sort of with the eagle eye, or you know that different mm -hmm. view. Because I would like to do that. Yeah. Um, and the other one I would love to get away from, but I don't think can do it yet is I'd love to get these on because I you know I, I can see all of your eyes and yes you, you know you can read it but seeing a face is different. 
I can sort of joke about being in San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> I think the only challenge you'll have is when you just zoom in so people can just see and participate through the Zoom. Is how do you do the presentation piece so they can see it so that oh, that camera just got to be able to see whatever and it is. The presentation at the same time. Yes, yeah, so well, not sure how we'll to do that. Yeah. But okay. it's good to talk. I'm about. sure there's a way to do yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to wind up talking about this. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Um, ready to move on? Okay. Yeah. Moving on to um, future agenda items. Grace, you want to bring that up? Okay, so for January, okay, you've got board meeting calendar on there. That's assuming uh, that's once the SLCT stuff all gets thought through. So I don't know if that's going to be yeah, maybe January or later. That's, that's a board meeting that's calendar. Not oh, oh board sorry. Meeting. Thank you. Yes, board meeting calendar. Okay, yes, we do need to do that. Uh, summer school. Yes. That'd be good. Which mm -hmm. um, happy? For this coming summer, what our thinking is around this coming summer. Audit report. Um, what else needs to go in on uh, January? Yeah, that will put likely won't be in January because of the delay in the guidance from the federal government that the auditors await on their their uh, report is not to be issued till January. It's going to move out. Okay. So so push that to February. Um, we need to talk about TK, don't we? It says weaker. Yeah. Do you think we'll have anything by? We could put a piece that leaves the slide if you need yeah, it. Yeah. So, I mean, the things I'm thinking of that we need to talk about on that is um, so the state was saying phase it in. So we could, you know, you know we, we could decide to phase it in faster or not. Um, there's the issue of, I don't know if your facilities workshop is going to cover um, any. Um, facilities, furniture kinds of issues that might be needed. There's the subject of curriculum. The TK is going to be younger on average students than it has been. So is there any, what happens with curriculum? So there's not a lot of curriculum. We're sending some teachers, some kinder teacher administrators to a conference in January. So maybe it has to be after yeah, January. But, yeah. Well, there won't be a doctor next year they're just they really haven't come out with a designated TK grant. Okay. At some point I'd like to talk about that. The, uh, planning, grant, the planning grant will pop off set a furniture need or anything like that. So we're working with principals on that. Okay. So we can put a slide in yeah, the do that. Okay. And and then you'll you'll have your regular update. Um so do we want to um do we want to have the principals come through we kind of start kind of a rotation of one principal Come through each meeting to kind of talk about what's going on at their school a little bit. Is that a nice possibility? Sure. I'll, I'll draw straws. We'll draw and, straws. And we'll be <laughs> I'll be in person. That's good. Okay. So, district update, we'll do like that. We should nice. have start. Yeah. And start. Uh, okay. Okay. Anything else? Um, I, I just said, I don't know if it needs to be on the agenda, but if it's a planning enrollment, at some point we might need some sort of uh, uh, school, you know, site. Uh, is that something that we should, is there any sort of discussion we need to have around that so that it's not a surprise? Mm -hmm. uh, or, I, I don't know exactly. Like, and maybe that's a, that could be a, a, an interest that's a pretty meaty conversation on setting criteria that could be something maybe in late spring, early summer, because we it would take us. We had some criteria set up summer that we could start that year. But we, we, we uptick, we sort of reversing the trend a little bit. Uh, but it still, I think it still needs to have those benchmarks. So that's probably going to be put that yeah, on the main take. Thinking, like, I, like the long term plan for it. Like, if these metrics are hit, right. then we have to start the discussion of yes. this well, is how we have the discussion so that, so that it's like we're just being transparent. Because I don't want to surprise like other districts. Right. So if we if we said this is kind of the criteria that says it's it's time to do this, yeah, and uh, and that would kick off a process of identifying exactly how we're going to go about it. Just like you know, it's not going up. Right. You know that, right? and I don't want to discuss it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so that need, that probably um, February, March, April time frame. Okay. So we need to we need to capture that on the list, uh, Grace. Okay. You can just call it declining. Yep. That's declining enrollment plan. plan. Effects. Effects. Okay. Moving on. Um, oh wait, no, sorry, I see a hand raised. Um, Grace, could you let Alicia in to comment? Yep, Alicia, go ahead. I am not seeing the bell schedule on the future agenda items. I know there is work in the background and I'm not seeing it there. Yes. Um, I don't think they've done a lot of work in the last 20 days. Um, so maybe you need to uh, go back to, to him and see when it's the time. Okay. Uh, all right. Good, good catch, Alicia. Um, Grace, if you just want to put bell schedule on there with a question mark, and then Ken will figure out where, where Steve's at on that. Okay. Moving on then to board activities. Uh, the one that I know about, I think you all got an email from Snahali inviting you to um, do her um, math class. Um, she's done this activity with them for several years in a row now, so I've actually seen it a couple of times. It's it's always fun to be with kids. It doesn't matter what the subject. It's fun to go see kids. I would respond like we just she sent it to us. I mean, let's see go over there, but we responded to say how they went today. So we just want to say how they then you let Steve know you'll be there. Okay. Yeah, we just coordinated together just so we're going at the same time. And she's really happy to have me. Yeah, she, she loves having just that the kids love the attention. <laughs> and it's it's uh, you know, it's one of those projects, so it's you know, it's a little more chaotic than a regular classroom. Oh, that's but... a really productive chaos. That would not say <laughs> chaos at all. It's very organized. Anything else in terms of board activities? Yeah, I think that's just in Oh, yes. Yeah. So what, what, Tuesday, we'll see you. Yes. yes. Yeah. Talk to Steve today, so we're expecting you. See you then. Okay. Anything else? Then we are adjourned for the network.